of the Sikh nation on the global scale. So we engage with the United Nations, we engage with member states of the United Nations, we engage with NGOs, we engage with other nations, many of which are represented here today. And we seek common ground. And the common ground that we seek is a common ground based on human rights. It's a common ground based on international law and on peace and a just world order. Sikhism teaches us about individual, personal, spiritual salvation. But under the Miri Piri concept, spiritual and temporal, under the Miri Piri concept, the Sikhs are required to go beyond the personal spiritual realm, and we are required to go into the world and to help bring about a just world order where the rights of everybody, all nations, all religions, men and women, the rights of everybody are respected. And an egalitarian society One. can function. Doesn't matter whichever part of the world, we will take these values forward. And the Sikhs rejected Guru Nanak Dev Ji. This year marks the 550th anniversary of his birth. Guru Nanak Dev Ji rejected the caste system. And the Sikhs ever since have been the target of those who promote the caste system because of this egalitarian philosophy. We will pursue human rights. And before I actually get into the conference agenda per se, there's a very, very important um, point that I'd like to reach, which is the recognition of the spectacularly good services to the Sikhs from a non-Sikh. Dr. Iktidar Jima, himself a Muslim, has taken it upon himself to talk about Sikhism, to talk about Sikh philosophy, to protect Sikh human rights, to endorse our call for self-determination. As a non-Sikh to do this, we are very grateful to him. We are humbled by the fact that a man who is of very high office himself. He's an advisor to the United Nations on the issue of the prevention of genocide and atrocity crimes. So a man who is recognized not just by us, the Sikhs, a man who is recognized by the international community, by the United Nations itself, has performed services, one of which I'm going to mention today, and he has come with a gift related to that. So, Dr. Jima, here by my side, took part in a UN convention that deals with the question of faith. How does faith relate to rights? How do you relate faith and religion to the concept of rights? And the point is, as Dr. Saab has shown, as I'll come on to, to mention, it is inextricably linked. The question of faith, belief, it's inextricably linked with the question of rights and human rights. So Dr. Saab took part in this conference in March 2017, and he brought about inclusion in the resulting document of that United Nations Convention, he brought about the inclusion of several couplets from the Siri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Maharaj diyan, Gurbani diyan, Tukan, 
as United Nations Declaration which Darja Hoya Pelli won in history. And this is being done by a, a non, as I say, a non sec. So we are deeply grateful for that. Uh, Dr. Saab has brought with him today a presentation which he's gifted to the World Sec Parliament of the relevant Garbani couplets that speak about Halemi Raj, a just order. And this is, Rob's, this, is, this is a command that's not made by any man. This is a command, this just order that we are seeking. This is a command from Mirwan, from God himself. Secondly, there is a couplet here referring to the role of women and the respect we have as a religion for women. How can you criticize women? They give birth to kings. How on earth can we see women as a lesser being than man? Sec the last one referred to here, the, the last couplet, refers to the fact that a God-centric person whose thinking is aligned with God, with Maharaj, Waheguru, Allah, God, whichever word you wish to use, the God-centric person is a person that sees God in everybody, that sees everybody as equal, as alike. So these are pearls of wisdom taken from our scriptures, the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib, which Dr. Saab has brought into a United Nations Declaration for the first time ever. He's presenting us with a memento of those couplets taken from the UN doc uh, document. Uh, so we are extremely grateful to Dr. Saab. Uh, I'd like to... I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to Dr. Saad personally, but I'm sure everybody in this chamber today would want to join me and show our appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Dr. Saad, please. all right. We are uh, humbled by his contribution, but we are also uh, hoping to mark this occasion by, give, by presenting some gifts of our own to uh, Dr. Chima. You want to do that, by yeah, okay. yeah. Uh Mantri Singh of the World Sec Parliament, coordinator of the World Sec Parliament, would just like to say a few words about the nature of this award, which is very pertinent to everything that I just said about Dr. Tim. Well, thank you very much for everybody to be here, first of all. Uh, the reason, when, when we saw his contributions to the Sikh nation, and as a non-Sikh, what he's done for Sikhism, we were just finding a way how we need to thank him. And there's only one personality that comes into our mind was Sai Mia Mirji. Sai Mia Mirji, who laid the foundation of Darbar Sahib, and we thought that as a part, representing Sikh nation as World Sikh Parliament, the best we can do for him is to give him a Sai Miami reward. So please, uh, I think, let's all applaud this. Yes, yes, yes. Manpreet Singh mentioned uh, that Sai Mia Mir was invited by our fifth Guru, Guru Arjan Dev Ji, to, to lay the foundation of Darbar Sahib, Amrit Sahib, sometimes referred to as the Golden Temple. And as part of our appreciation, the World Sec Parliament would like to present... Upper Museum. Yeah, Museum. Okay. Uh, a photograph of the Darbar Sahib and... In reference to the Miri Piri concept, 
Our friends at the Sikh Museum in Derby have brought along a memento from their museum, a fantastic collection of artifacts from Sikh history, which is a canon um, which reflects the state that the Sikhs had in Punjab before British annexation. So, Dr. Saab, uh, once again, from everybody in this room, thank you very much. So, with that, I'd like to move on. We've got, a, a, as I say, a long list of speakers. Um, two keynote speakers. Um, Dr. Jima himself, because of his role as an advisor to the United Nations on the prevention of genocide and atrocity crimes, it's obviously fundamentally relevant to the issue that we have today. The threat of war, of catastrophic war in South Asia. Not just Punjab, but Kashmir and other regions is something that is clearly within the atrocity crimes scenario. So without further ado, Dr. Saab, um, I'm going to pass on to you if you could make your contribution today. Thank you. In the name of our Lord, who is merciful and beneficent, Assalamu alaikum. And let's contribute Fateh, granted to all of us, regardless of faith and religion, by the father of the martyrs and by the son of a martyr. Why Guruji ka khalsa? Why Guruji ki Fateh? I know it's a council house, but Fateh, wherever is contributed, should be loud enough to contribute. So once more, Why Guruji ka khalsa? Why Guruji ki Fateh? I'm greatly honored and humbled, and um, it was indeed a surprise. Um, I came to contribute reflections on the topic, but it's very kind of the Sikh community, which is my own community, and by the World Sikh Parliament to acknowledge. Um, I, I don't think I have rendered any services because Guru Granth Sahib Ji is not only Sikh Guru. It has Farid in it, it has Pakna in it, and it has Kabir in it. So it is our common heritage. And it was recognized as such in the past as well. Um, before partition, I've heard from my ancestors, people always used to say, Baba Nanak Shah Fakir, Sikhanda Guru, Musalmananda Peer. And wherever in the history we walk, Muslims always walked with the Sikhs. Whether it was Bhai Mardana with Guru Nanak, whether it was Sai Mia Mir with Guru Arjun, whether it was Nabi Khan and Ghani Khan with the Guru Gobind Singh Ji, wherever. Muslims were always side by side with the Sikhs. Um, I would not like to deviate from the topic because the problem with the, with the people who can speak is they can deviate very easily uh, from the topics. Um, when it comes to this conference and when it comes to this, these three angs and tuks from Guru Granth Sahib, in the way it has been included in the UN Faithful Right Declaration as the first ever part of Guru Granth Sahib being included in a UN Charter, where uh, I got it included, I've given the correspondence to G for authenticity because a lot of people take rights of the things they never did. Uh, one thing was very clear to me. The Sikh nation, if it wants to survive, it has to adopt Miri and Piri. At the moment, it's only Piri, but you have to seek Miri unless nations without state have no stake on the world forums. When uh, we were gathered together at the United Nations to put, because we have a new Secretary General as well now in the UN, to put forward a Faithful Right Declaration, there was no state there to get Guru Granth Sahib in the declaration. Quran was proposed by 52 member Muslim states. You have State of Israel, which will talk about Torah and inclusion in, in the UN Charter. You would have uh, Christian states who would back Bible, but there is nobody in the UN structure as a member state to get Guru Granth Sahib in. 
of uh, given uh, Ranjit Kaur's comments, which clearly exhibit that while I was chairing the committee of the draft for this declaration, I said Sikhism is the fifth largest religion of the world which seeks for the common humanity. And Guru Granth Sahib should be included in the declaration. Otherwise, it cannot become a universal declaration for faith for rights. But it comes with a big message. For any religion to survive in the world, it has to seek sovereignty. And it is everyone's right. United Nations, on whose advisory board I am on, it was established by a Dumbarton proposal, a proposal well before the UN was established. And the first rule of that proposal was every nation has the right to self-determination. In 1948, when the nations of the world gathered together in San Francisco to establish the United Nations, Article 1 clearly stated the, the purpose to establish UN was to give people right to self-determination. And Sikhs by all means and Kashmiris by all means are a nation by any definition and have the right to self-determination. When it comes to South Asia, because our conference was about nuclear flashpoint and about South Asia, we are at the UN and all my colleagues, because uh, our Under Secretary General Diamond Diang, who chairs our UN advisory board, he directly reports to Security Council, uh, not to uh, Secretary General, but to the Security Council. He always asked me that what's happening in this region. It concerns all of us. And someone who knows the history of that very region and of uh, a major majoritarian rule in India, where um, you would find a quote-unquote democratic elected prime minister, when she lost it in the court, she imposed emergency in the so-called democracy, which was like a martial law. And then she declared the country secular. And not only she did that, after that when she saw that she's going to lose the election, she attacked Darbar Sahib to win the majoritarian sympathy vote from the majoritarian community. So if that prime minister can use that mentality to victimize a marginalized minority community for the vote bank, the party which rules today is much worse than that. And we have seen that tension ex escalating in the region just for the election politics, where a major majoritarian party or of our religion, which wants to declare all India as a Hindu nationalist state, they tried their best, I think, in the last two, three months to escalate tension and to wage a war. With a, with a neighbor. South Asia is not a region where there are two nuclear states. South Asia is a region where there are three nuclear states. India, China, and Pakistan. And State of India has been in war with both India and China in the past. And in the way it has spread terrorism across the borders while operating from Afghanistan, and 10 years of long war of terror in Pakistan, and now it wants to interfere in CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is supposed to bring prosperity in the region. The only way they can stop it is by waging a war. So it concerns all of us, because in the past also, it was Punjab all the time. Punjabiyat is our common identity. Whether we are Sikhs, whether we are Muslims, we have a shared heritage, like many other nations of the world. Our language, our culture constitute a cultural identity. Look at 1947. Whose genocide was it? Punjabis. Most of the Punjabis were killed, millions of them. And look at the records of the British archives. The, Br the Britain was leaving India in 1948, not in 1947. But who was the one who pushed Lord Mountbatten to quit one year earlier, which resulted into the the massacre of million of Punjabis. That very party is now one of the opposition party in India. Look at 1965. Where war was fought? Who were killed? Punjabis on both sides, in majority. And for the Sikhs, I, I really get worried. People always ask me, you are a Muslim, why you are so much worried about the Sikhs? 
because six lives on the border of three nuclear states. And for, for a state on right or left, it's very easy to drop an atom bomb and finish the Sikh nation forever from its roots where it once lived. It has happened with other nations and it can happen with the Sikh nation as well. Therefore, I always argue, although I have been um, called previously a terrorist sympathizer in the UN, uh, somebody wrote a letter, a lovely member state, and I don't need to name that state, you will know. They said, uh, they sent a letter to the Secretary General that on your advisory board there is a ter terrorist sympathizer who would ask for people's sovereignty and who would ask uh, and support people's right of self-determination. But I always say uh, to my UN colleagues, I support the right of self-determination of Kashmiris, of Sikhs, of Nagas, of seven sister states of the northeast of India because I want peace in the region. Because we need buffer states between these three states which would split and separate the borders of three hostile neighbors who have fought more than four wars with each other. Without having buffer states, you cannot have peace in South Asia. Because these nations are not willing to engage with each other and they are not willing to maintain peace and prosperity in the region. The only solution for the South Asian peace is that you need Khalistan, which would split the borders of India and Pakistan. You need an independent, autonomous Kashmir, which would split the borders of India, Pakistan and China. Without that, you cannot achieve peace. I may uh, sound like an idiot to you, but this is the only viable solution and one day world would have to reach to this conclusion. When it comes to the Sikh sovereignty or anyone's sovereignty, we are not against any nation. Sikh sovereignty doesn't have to come through any militancy. Sikh sovereignty doesn't have to come through any violence. It is embedded in the UN Charter under Article 1, which guarantees that every nation has the right to self-determination and it was Guru Nanak who said, Nanak Raj Chalaya, Sachkut Stani, Niv De, Niv De. And Guru Gobind Singh, he established Khalsa. I always say to people, that we always celebrate with Sakhi. It's not a season of Mila. It is not a season of eating Jalebi and Pakore. It is a creation of a nation by a Sikh master. And the reason to establish that Khalsa was for Khalsa to seek sovereignty. Because Raj bina na taram chale hai, taram bina sab dale male. So by all means, we all in a very civic and civilized manner should today pass that the Sikhs have the right to self-determination. And if the peace has to be achieved in the South Asian region, that is only through giving the nations a right of self-determination. The so-called democracy, the largest democracy in the world, should learn from our democracy, our British democracy, where we have given right of self-determination to people of Scotland, where we have given right of self-determination to this own nation to decide the future, whether we want to be in the European Union or not. They should look at Canada, who has given people of Montreal a right of self-determination, whether they want to be part of Canada or not. They should look at the Chinese model, who are giving right of self-determination to people of Hong Kong. If the real democracies work that way, India should look at this. But unfortunately, in my assessment, it's a procedural democracy, which get majoritarian rule elected, which discriminate against minorities, not only in day-to-day -day life, but also constitutionally and legally. I would leave some of my, uh, one of my report, which was, uh, which I was asked to write by the United States State Department about the constitutional and legal challenges faced by the religious minorities in India. And in my report, I very clearly mentioned it was published in the Trump administration. So Indians started propagating a Trojan horse in the Trump administration because they <laughs> it surprised them that such a report was published under a uh, newly elected uh, Trump administration. So by all means, if the Sikhs have to survive, it has to seek sovereignty. And we all endorse that. And thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Um, a fantastic contribution, um, which just underlines a couple of things. Firstly, 
that Dr. Chima is a great friend of the Sikhs, and not just of the Sikhs, of the Kashmiris, of every nation, every religion, which simply wants to exercise its rights that are guaranteed by the United Nations. So he's a man of principle and a great man, and we have honored him today, and rightly so. I'd like to move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Ani Wakar is a, uh, a lecturer um, at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Westminster. Uh, Dr. Wakar is an expert on the issue that we're discussing here today. So we're talking about international relations, we're talking about the risk of a war between India and Pakistan, we're talking about the consequences of such a war. And Hopefully, Dr. Wakar, you'll come on and endorse what we're saying, which is the need to avoid it at all costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Are you on? Yeah, I think it's working. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the World Sikh Parliament, especially uh, Ranjit Singh, for actually inviting me um, to talk on this very important, uh, pertinent issue at the moment, um, the dialogue for peace and for trying to get the message out there on an international level, um, to try to stop the, the sort of rhetoric that is coming out for a potential war between two nuclear armed neighbors, that is India and Pakistan. Now, um, obviously, as, as an academic for many, many years, I have been looking at especially the core issues relating to uh, the India's nuclear program as well as Pakistan's nuclear pro program. And I've also uh, been researching a lot on the nuclear non-proliferation regime as a whole and how international community, especially the uh, permanent five members of Security Council, um, sort of try to adhere to these international uh, regimes, which allow for, and I usually say that they sort of uh, monopolize over the idea that who are nuclear weapon states and who are non-nuclear weapon states. And this is quite interesting to see that how they basically are trying to say that, yes, we are the nuclear weapon state, whereas anybody who has tested any nuclear weapon, uh, you know, after 1967 um, will not be a nuclear weapon state. But we all know that um, since the 1970s, India detonated their first nuclear weapon, uh, which was called a Smiling Buddha. And later on, obviously, Pakistan um, tested their nuclear weapons in the late 1990s. Now, the recent events with regards to Pulwama, as we all know, the Pulwama attacks, have highlighted the fact that these two countries can actually uh, come very close to pressing that button. Um, and by pressing that button, I mean pressing that nuclear button. Now, the problem remains and has always been the same. I mean, since the independence, since both the countries actually got their independence, the problem has always been for them the issue of Kashmir. And many times there have been various skirmishes, there have been many, many conflicts in the 1960s, then in the 1970s, even in 1990s, we had, you know, uh, India actually mobilizing their troops around uh, the borders. So this, um, obviously, as an academic who looks at the South Asian context, um, I, I try to sort of analyze a lot of areas, not in the past history, but whatever has been happening now ever since. And how do we go about creating a certain solution to these, or bring about a solution to this problem? Now, um, obviously, we have a post-colonial legacy. And um, I was just looking at the drafts for resolution for the World Sikh Parliament, and I very uh, uh, rightly agree with the fourth one, where you were sort of requesting uh, and the reason for us to have this conference is to basically request the UK government to, uh, as a permanent uh, you know, member, to raise these issues highlighted because they were once a part of this whole uh, you know, uh, ordeal that all the South Asians are still going through. Um, it was, obviously, with the colonial power, was a very chaotic departure. The way that the boundaries were uh, you know, demarcated, the way they were there, left, uh, it was very much chaotic. And I suppose that it, it's very good to actually put this resolution to say that, yes, the reason that why we are here is because we are demanding this. We need to raise these issues that are being highlighted. Um, and how do we go about it? We need to bring 
these issues on the table involve all those parties who have their own political aspirations, who have their own political rights, whether those are Kashmiris, whether that's Sikh nation, they all have their specific political aspirations. Now the problem with the, both the governments is that they never involve any of these parties. They never bring out the marginalized communities in. So the only thing that they're probably thinking about is their own power structures. How are they actually going to play amongst themselves? So this is a very, very good, I suppose, resolution here. Um, now, Kashmir, I will talk about because uh, Dr. Chima has very nicely sort of put, talked about Sikh nations. So I'll actually go to Kashmir yeah, and I'll sure. talk a little bit about Kashmir because I've been doing a lot of research over the past few years on Kashmir. And um, Kashmir at one point, uh, even Bill Clinton basically said, is one of the most highly dangerous and militarized you know, place in the world. Uh, about 68,000, even more than uh, 68,000 people basically uh, have, be, have, have thought to have died because of all the insurgencies. At the same time, there are many disappearances, you know, Kashmiri uh, people who have disappeared without any trace. And I think the, the problem is basically that the Indian government is not, is basically keeping all this issue under, you know, some, some under the bags. If you ask any sort of, um, you know, uh, politician, they will always deny the fact that there is no such thing happening in Kashmir whatsoever. So I think this is one major issue that they need to really come out clean and talk about all the human rights violations that are taking place in Kashmir. And um, ever since, uh, you know, uh, 1989, since all the insurgencies, you know, that have been taking place in Kashmir, even the human rights groups have actually gone and talked about how India has been response, you know, responding to those public protests with a very disproportionate um, you know, force. So, so even recently we had the Human Rights uh, Commission report that talked about you know, how they have been you know, sort of, um, pro uh, you know, dealing with these protests. Um, and I think that this is, is, it's very important to actually bring in these Kashmiris, these Kashmiris who have their own political aspirations onto the table and ask them what, how exactly do they feel about this whole situation and how do they think that this can be resolved. Similarly as, um, you know, the Sikh nation, because I think it's very important to highlight the Sikh nation. And while all these Palmama attacks were going on, I sort of read a very interesting article uh, which talked about how a very small village, a Gilpun village, near the 10 kilometer border of the international border with Pakistan, and how there was this hysteria of war and how people were actually forced to leave their places, to leave their houses when, when they knew that they, the, you know, the, the, they're actually, is actually going to be, you know, they were all belonging to agricultural families, backgrounds, and they knew, knew that they, there was harvest uh, harvesting going to take place and with all this hysteria they were actually told to leave their places and um, in specifically in one of the articles there was this um, sort of a poll that take, took place and, and they asked about all you know all the Punjabis in that region of how they feel about this whole hysteria of this war and they said well it's not good for us at all because what is happening is that we still see people going and coming but then the way that the media is actually sort of bringing everything out there and the way that they're actually forcing us to move out of the places is not the right way I mean what should we do where, where do we go this is this is our home so I think this is it's very very important to actually bring all these parties onto the table and talk about the sort of solutions that that these people need because it's a diverse I mean if you look at um, you know the Punjab itself it's diverse you look at Kashmir it's diverse so all the political you know aspirations of the people need to be taken into consideration um, the other most important thing is um, with the with the idea that you know I mean as an academic who sort of thinks that nuclear war can actually bring about a huge environmental uh, uh, you know, catastrophe, not just on the humanitarian level, but on an environmental level. So the concerns are on both the sides. Um, there are people who um, you know, sort of very much are against the whole you know, sort of rhetoric about you know, what needs to be done about this nuclear sort of uh, you know, uh, 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 rhetoric of war that keeps coming from India and Pakistan all the time. Why is it that this 
issue is being politicized so much. And as we can see that in India at, the, at that time when Pulvama attacks were taking place, obviously with the elections coming in India, this was very much politicized in a way to basically create this certain uh, a way for Modi that, oh, yes, I'm basically, I am doing something for the nation. And this is the way that I'll, I'll you know, sort of go about doing that basically I will, if, if it comes to this, we can wage a war, you know, we can have a nuclear war, but not realizing that what catastrophe that can bring, right? Even if there is that uh, war hysteria, I mean, the idea that, yes, we have nuclear weapons, you have nuclear weapons, you know, we just with a push of button, we can actually, you know, uh, uh, it will be a total annihilation. The, even the idea, I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous for the leaders to actually think about, you know, just that way they can actually possibly use their nuclear weapons for their own politi political gains, for politicizing that issue even more. Um, now, the, the answer, obviously, is there is no certain solution. There are many solutions, but obviously the idea is for us to actually be here, is to talk about these issues, bring them out on the table, create this huge awareness so that people understand where we are. Uh, I always talk about these subaltern vo voices, you know, the subaltern voices that come from all these marginalized communities, from all these groups who have their own aspirations. And I believe that it's very important to actually bring them on the table and try to bring a solution to a problem. Um, there is a very one interesting saying, uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to end with that as well. Um, uh, and Amit Roy is one of a uh, uh, very well-known author, and he talks about how, what nuclear war, the, what sort of catastrophe these nuclear wars can bring. He talks about that the key of resolving any sort of dispute or any sort of international conflict, and when we talk about this, we're talking about these two nuclear-armed countries, India and Pakistan, the only way to resolving this international conflict would be to look for a very viable solution. And within that viable solution, you need to not just come from a power structure within, but you need to recognize that there are marginalized communities, there are certain groups that have their own goals and aspirations that need to be considered. And then finding, trying to find a common ground. Now, obviously, now and again, we've had many peace dialogues between India and Pakistan. Uh, there have been many uh, talks, you know, over the past many sort of years, especially in the 1990s. But every time something had happened, you know, later on you'd see that they, somehow they have actually been left, um, you know, in, in a loop. So we really need to find a common ground, need to find something, a solution that would have proactive strategies. And it's very important for all of us to have those proactive strategies in hand. And I. I find that with these resolutions, I mean, we can start off with having a certain proactive strategy or bringing about a certain clear idea that we'll put on the table, you know, on the Human Rights Commission. Again, um, using effective negotiation. So without bringing all the parties onto the table, you can't have effective negotiations. So if, if, if the Sikh nation is not being involved, if the Kashmiris are not being involved, then obviously you will never ever have a proactive strategy. At the same time, they will never have any effective um, uh, negotiation. So the negotiation and communication is very important. They need to understand what is that, 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 you know, what are the aspirations that are required and how do we actually bring them into a proactive strategy and bring them into place. Um, and then again, appreciating different cultural differences, you know. It, they, uh, like I said, it's, there's, it's, there's diversity out there. And we need to understand that with the, the beauty about diversity is to actually appreciate it and look into the, 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 the beauty of how, you know, you can actually integrate this. And I think this is the only way that, that a solution can be brought out. With regards, I mean, there have been many sort of other narratives that have been brought forward. I was, I'm actually working on writing a book at the moment. And one of the areas that I'm focusing on is actually that we as people, you know, uh, as various communities. We're sick and tired of the same rhetoric that keeps coming from these countries. You know, and, and every other, like, five, ten years, we see that there's some sort of a, you know, a war is hanging there or some sort of a conflict is there. And I think what we need to do is, again, we need to change and look at the narratives. We need to bring these groups on into the talks. That's what's not happening. We are not being involved. You're not being involved. So these, these issues are being kept 
under the bag. And hence, that is what is creating more problems. And these are the concerns for all of us, you know, for all the Kashmiris, for all the Sikhs. And I'm not just talking about, I'm also talking about so many other marginalized communities. So, so they, the, they need to actually be brought into the whole process of a dialogue of, of, of peacemaking to understand what exactly they want. And the reason that we are doing all this is to actually create that international awareness that yes, we have people here who are very much concerned about this. And we need to take these concerns on an international level and put them into human rights, uh, United Nations Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very grateful to uh, Dr. Annie Wakar, uh, clearly an expert on, on the region. What struck me in particular was the, the emphasis that she put on including those nations, those groups that are currently not at the table. So whether it's resolving the underlying struggle for self-determination in Kashmir or in Punjab, whether it's eliminating the risk of catastrophic war in that region, we are the stakeholders. How can it be that the, the stakeholders themselves are not at the table? It's a, it's a hugely important point, which is being completely missed by the narrative, as you say, uh, Dr. Wakard, the narrative that is being pushed by those in power. We need to break that narrative. Conference will contribute towards that process. Uh, I'd like to call on our next speaker, um, who's Reverend Canon Dr. Joshua Raja. Um, Joshua needs to leave for other commitments. And so I'm sorry, very sorry, uh, uh, Reverend, that we, we've actually delayed you already. So would you like to come to the front? Please, 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 come to the front. Please, please. Come. Please, 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 come. come. I, think, I think what we'll do... Uh, doctor, if you can take my chair. Can you take my chair? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me and, uh, you know, a good friend of Chima and uh, uh, Ranjit. I, I, I speak uh, from an Indian Christian perspective, as basically I'm a British Indian uh, minority perspective. Uh, so I just start with this very interesting uh, um, uh, statement of 5th century BC, Yadum Ure Yavaram Keli, that is uh, one of our poets. Uh, long back, a Tamil poet, uh, fifth century poet, he said this, every place is my place, every human is my kin. And which is very similar to uh, what uh, Guru Nanak also said in one of his conversation, that you think of yourself as Hindus and Muslims first and last. You forget that you are men first and something else next. It's a very interesting, uh, you know, thinking outside the box. Uh, which is what is very important uh, nowadays, uh, because we are all emotionally charged with uh, nation states. And uh, uh, I think there are, I still remember, uh, first time I hosted a Pakistani Indian lawyers uh, conference in Bangalore, 2001, uh, in Bangalore, and we felt that we were all very friends, and, uh, and we spoke the same kind of nearly same uh, words and language and of love and kindness. And, uh, you know, we, at the end of the day, we found that we didn't disagree anything. <laughs> and we felt that all the human rights of every individual must be respected. And the aspirations of people for self-determination must be respected. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, we, we said together, uh, mostly that uh, not only self-determination, but also even to raise the voice, I think even to raise the voice today, that all the political prisoners without any charge must be immediately released. I think 20 years ago we raised that. I want to say it today even, because the reality has not changed much, sadly. And, uh, and also we have to think uh, even Edward Said, uh, you know, re re reviewing this uh, Huntington thesis, he said, clash of ignorance. Uh, it is the ignorance which is kind of controlling the mass cons conscience or consciousness, we call it. And it is sadly, unless we address 
to reverse it with alternative narratives and thinking, we are never going to succeed in this journey. And I think that is where the pressure points from public intellectuals and public groups from both nations should be working together. I would support that from both sides, Christians, women, lawyers, and all the activities should find a place to come together and to see we are all the same beings, same human, and we can work together for the betterment of each other rather than throw on each other. You know, this is a very interesting saying, the weapons of mass distractions. They use very interesting stories, like, you know, we are keeping, we are not keeping our nuclear weapons for Tiwali. <laughs> That's what we heard. And another response, we are not either keeping it for Diwali either. I want these pressure points to be started continuously at grassroots and at public intellectuals, at uh, mass level, that we keep these people with an alternative voices, alternative thinking, alternative narratives. I would like to see that to happen because I would like to say this as a uh, if anyone is hearing, that I hope all the alternative voices will raise and put the pressure with the new government in India that they will pass a constitutional amendment saying that NFU, no first use, will become part and parcel of the constitutional amendment, even if the Prime Minister thinks he cannot do it by himself. I would certainly recommend that to be the consideration even in Pakistan, so that people cannot go around and threaten unless at least majority or even two-thirds of the parliament passes in favor of it, because that ties up things. And even I would say we should have an alternative narrative to nuclear deterrent, the idea of nuclear deterrent, which is uh, actually not a, a good idea in South Asia, because you know, I, I don't know, it's my nation, India has become a lynching nation. My nation has become a raping nation. My nation has become, uh, sadly, vigilante nation. Uh, you know, how do we challenge this and reverse this ignorance and emotionalized idea of nation and state? We need to start thinking alternatively, outside the box. Pong, Pong said that. Guru Nanak said this. Let us also say it ourselves today and think outside the box. Thank you much. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Joshua John. Um, that was uh, electrifying. Um, thank you very much. You, I, I understand you need to leave, so, but thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I'm going to um, call um, a representative. I thought it might be time for a Sikh speaker. <laughs> um, just in case we're wondering. Um, um, and actually, um, Joga Sengji, who's a coordinator of the World Sikh Parliament, has played a massive role in bringing this institution into being. He's a man who has um, an unimaginable ability to, to work with different groups, with diverse groups, for many, many years within the Sikhs and beyond. He's worked with people, and sometimes with people who don't share his agenda, but he has that ability, and that's been instrumental, in my view, in helping bring about the formation of the World Sec Parliament. Um, so I'm going to ask him to speak. He'll speak in Punjabi. Very good. Um, and he will be actually also sharing a message from the Jathidar of the Akal Takht, which has been provided by his spokesman, uh, Sardar Advocate Amar Singh Chahal, who is a senior lawyer in India. Um, and he's the spokesman for the Jathidar of the Akal Takht. Now, it's very important that we recognize the role of the Akal Takht. We've spoken, Dr. Stima mentioned it, I, I mentioned it earlier about the role of Miri Piri, spiritual and temporal. The Akal Takht, for those of us who, those in the room who, who are not aware of the, the Akal Takht, the Akal Takht, Akal is immortal. Takht 
is a throne. So our gurus constructed a throne of the immortal. It's a building in Amritsar, just across the way from the Darbar Sahib or the Golden Temple. And where the Darbar Sahib represents our spiritual sovereignty, the Akal Takh Sahib represents our temporal sovereignty as a nation. And the Sarbat Khalsa National Gathering in 2015 um, appointed Jagdar Singh Hawara as the Jathidar, as the spokesman, as the leader, as the representative of the Qom, the Jathidar of the Akal Takh. Now, Jathidar Sahib at the moment is incarcerated. And he's incarcerated in uh, Tihar Jail because he was one of those brave souls that resisted the Indian aggression against the Sikh nation that commenced largely in June 1984. There are many others who sit in jails that are victims. They're not aggressors. They are victims of the aggression of the Indian state against the Sikhs. They exercise the right of self-determination. Every nation on the planet believes in the right of self-determination and it believes in the right of self-defense. And this is what the Sikhs have done. They are criminalized, they are vilified, they are called terrorists. Even supporters of the Sikhs are called terrorists, sympathizers. So the Jathidar Sahib is in jail. One day we hope he'll be with us in person, but until then, um, he operates through contacts and uh, Amar Singh Chahal, as a senior lawyer, is his spokesman and has passed on a, a message today, which I'm going to ask uh, Jogha Singh Ji please to, to read out and share. Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahiguru Ji Ki Fateh. Jis Tera Aap Ji Nuh Pata Hai Ke Aapaan Chentet Haan Ke Je India Pakistan Di Nuclear Di Ladaai Laag Gai Ta Baut Ghenti Jidhe Sekhya Punjab De Vich Una Da Sab To Jada Nakshan Ho Vega Kyoke Ladaai Jada ਮਸਲਾ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਮਰਜੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਲੜਾਈ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਚ ਲੜੇ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਵੀ ਸਾਦੀ ਉਹ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਸਾਦੀ ਉਹ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਭਾਈਚਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਦੀ ਜਿੱਥੋਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਆਏ ਆ ਬਿਸ਼ੱਕ ਦੀ ਉਧਰਲਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੋਵੇ ਬਿਸ਼ੱਕ ਦੀ ਉਧਰਲਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੋਵੇ ਦੋਨਾਂ ਲਈ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉੱਥੇ ਪੀਸ ਰਵੇ ਤੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਨਿਊਕਲੀਅਰ ਬੋਰ ਨਾ ਕਦੇ ਵੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੌਮ ਦਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਭਾਈਚਾਰੇ ਦਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਗੁਆਂਢੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਪਰ ਪਿਛਲਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਕਾਫੀ ਚਿੰਤਾਜਨਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਅਜੇ ਵੀ ਜੇ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੀ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਗਿਣਤੀ ਨੇ ਜਿੱਤ ਗਏ ਤਾਂ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਰੁਖ ਕਿੱਧਰ ਨੂੰ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਇਹ ਬੜਾ ਚਿੰਤਾ ਦਾ ਵਿਸ਼ਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਵੀਰ ਭੈਣਾ ਵੋਟਰ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਮੇਰੀ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਕੁਰਬਾਨੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵੀਰ ਆ ਭੈਣਾ ਆ ਖੜੇ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਦੁੱਖ ਹੰਡਾਇਆ ਪਿਛਲੇ 30 35 ਸਾਲ ਤੋਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੈਸੇ ਵੋਟਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਕਦੇ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਣਨਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਵੋਟਾਂ ਪੈ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਕਹਿ ਰੁਕਣੀਆਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਰ ਫੇ ਵੀ ਜੇ ਕੋਈ ਉੱਥੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦਾ ਚਲੇ ਜਾਵੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਿੱਖ ਹੱਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਪਿਛਲੇ 30 35 ਸਾਲ ਤੋਂ ਸੰਘਰਸ਼ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਕੁਸ ਹਾਲਾਤ ਥੋੜੇ ਸੁਧਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਇਹ ਮੇਰਾ ਯਕੀਨ ਹੈ ਵੋਟਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਕਦੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਰਾਜ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲ ਸਕਦਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਹੁਕਮ ਹੈ ਰਾਜ ਬਿਨਾ ਨਾ ਧਰਮ ਚਲੇ ਹੈ ਧਰਮ ਬਿਨਾ ਸਭ ਦਾਲੇ ਮਲੇ ਹੈ ਕੋਈ ਕਿਸੇ ਕੋ ਰਾਜ ਨਾ ਦੇ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਲੈ ਹੈ ਨਿਜ ਬਲ ਸੇ ਲੈ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਬਲ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰਨਾ ਪੈਣਾ ਤੇ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਰਬੱਤ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਚੁਣਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਸੀ ਕਲਤਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਸਨੇਹਾ ਐਡਵੋਕੇਟ ਸਰਦਾਰ ਅਮਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਚਾਲ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਪਹੁੰਚਾ ਹੈ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਦੂਜੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਮੇਰੇ ਵੀਰ ਨੇ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕ
ਦਿੱਲੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੱਖਿਆ ਹੈ ਕੋਈ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਤੋਂ ਤੇ ਕੇਸ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੁਣ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਟ੍ਰਾਂਸਫਰ ਕਰਤਾ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਤਾਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਬਰਗਾੜੀ ਮੋਰਚੇ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਬਾਹਰਲੇ ਵੀ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਚ ਜਾਣਗੇ ਪਰ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਉਲਟ ਹੁਣ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਵਾਲੇ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਬਾਹਰ ਭੇਜਣ ਲੱਗ ਪਏ ਜਾਨੀ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਕੋਈ ਵਾਅਦਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਵਾਅਦਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਕੋਈ ਪੂਰਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਦੀਆਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਪਿਛਲੇ 30 35 ਸਾਲ ਤੋਂ ਸਬਕ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਵੀ ਸਟੈਪ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਚੱਕਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਸੋਚ ਸਮਝ ਕੇ ਚੱਕਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਚਿਰ ਤੋਂ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰੇ ਨੂੰ ਤੋੜਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਸਤਿਗੁਰੂ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਦ੍ਰਿੜ ਰਾਜ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆਪਣੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਜ਼ਾ ਮਿਲੀ ਪੂਰੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਦੇ ਚਿੰਤਾ ਜਨਖਾਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਵੀ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮੈਨੇ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਵਾ ਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਸੁੱਖ ਸਨੇਹਾ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਇੱਕੋ ਇੱਕ ਆਸ਼ਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਖਾਸ ਕਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬਾਹਰਲੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਕੋਲ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਵਧੀਆ ਮੌਕਾ ਆ ਆਪਣਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਪਲੇਟਫਾਰਮ ਤੇ ਅਜਾਗਰ ਕਰਦਾ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਸਾਲ ਜਦੋਂ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਸਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਜਾਣਕਾਰੀ ਲਈ ਦੱਸਾਂ ਕਿ ਹਰਪਾਲ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਰਪਾਲ ਸਿੰਘ ਚੀਮਾ ਵਾਰ ਆਏ ਸੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਵਾਪਸ ਗਿਆ ਦਾ ਪਾਸਪੋਰਟ ਉਹਦੀ ਵਾਪਸ ਲੈ ਲਿਆ ਇੱਕ ਮਿਸਾਲ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਆ ਜੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਚ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਹੋ ਆਪਣੇ ਹੱਕਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋ ਬਾਹਰ ਆ ਕੇ ਕਿਤੇ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਤਾਂ ਵਾਪਸ ਗਿਆ ਦਾ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਪਾਸਪੋਰਟ ਵੀ ਮੁੜ ਕੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਸੋ ਉੱਥੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਹੱਕਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਵੀਰ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਲਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਅੜੇ ਹੋਏ ਹਨ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦੀ ਚੜ੍ਹਦੀ ਕਲਾ ਲਈ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਆਜ਼ਾਦੀ ਲਈ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਬੜਾ ਔਖਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਚ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨਾ ਹੈ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਰੈਕਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਪਰ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਾਹਰ ਔਖਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਤਾਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਬੜੀ ਆਸਾਨੀ ਨਾਲ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਹਨ ਐਸ ਲੌਂਗ ਆਪਾਂ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਕੋਈ ਦਿੱਕਤ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਤੇ ਦੇਰੋਂ ਦਿਨ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮੁਸ਼ਕਲਾਂ ਦਾ ਸਾਹਮਣਾ ਕਰਨਾ ਪੈ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਹੁਣ ਸਾਰੇ ਵਿਜ਼ਿਟ ਵੀ ਬੰਦ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਮਾਤਾ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਹੁਣ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਕੋਈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹੋਰ ਵਿਜ਼ਿਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੁਣ ਆਹ ਹਾਲਾਤ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਕੋ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਛੱਦ ਅੱਗੇ ਝੁਕੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਕੰਪਰੋਮਾਈਜ਼ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮੇਰੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀਰ ਵਿਚਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦੀ ਕੋਈ ਸ਼ਰਤ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਵੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੰਪਰੋਮਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਕੇ ਚੱਲੋ ਤਾਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਮਰਜ਼ੀ ਨਾਲ ਚੱਲੋ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਤੱਕ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਚੱਲਣਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਜੇ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾਣਾ ਤਾਂ ਫਿਰ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਉਸ ਕੈਟਾਗਰੀ 'ਚ ਪਾਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸਾਰੀ ਜੇਲ੍ਹ 'ਚ ਸਾਰੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਜੇਲ੍ਹ 'ਚ ਕੱਟਣੀ ਪੈਂਦੀ ਆ ਜਦ ਕਿ ਉੱਥੇ ਦੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਦੇ ਅਨੁਸਾਰ 14-15 ਸਾਲ ਲਾਈਫ ਇਨਪਰਜਮੈਂਟ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਬੰਦਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੂੰ 25-25 ਸਾਲ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਉਹ ਜੇਲ੍ਹ ਅਜੇ ਭੁਗਤ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਲਿਖਿਆ ਕਿ ਸਾਰੀ ਉਮਰ ਉਹ ਜੇਲ੍ਹਾਂ 'ਚ ਰਹਿਣਗੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਖਰੀ ਸਾਲ ਵੀ ਜੇਲ੍ਹ 'ਚ ਹੀ ਰਹਿਣਗੇ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਮਾਇਨੋਰਟੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਆਪਣੀ ਯੂਨਿਟੀ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਬੜਾ ਬੜਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਹੈ ਆਪਣੇ ਲਈ ਮੈਂ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਆਪਣੀ ਦਿਨ ਦਿਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਯੂਨਿਟੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਟੁੱਟ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਵੱਧ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਹੀ ਸੋ ਇਹਦੇ ਲਈ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਯਤਨਸ਼ੀਲ 
ਉਲਟ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਮੰਤਰੀ ਇਮਰਾਨ ਖਾਨ ਇਤਨੇ ਦਿਲੇ ਤੇ ਸੂਝਵਾਨ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਤਾਂ ਹਾਲਤ ਅੱਜ ਨਾਲੋਂ ਵੀ ਕਿਤੇ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਵਿਗੜ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕਰਤਾਰਪੁਰ ਲਾਂਘੇ ਨੂੰ ਖੋਲਣਾ ਵੀ ਇੱਕ ਸਲਾਗਾ ਜੋ ਕਦਮ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਦੇ 550ਵੇਂ ਆਗਮਨ ਪੁਰਬ ਮੌਕੇ ਅਮਨ ਸ਼ਾਂਤੀ ਦੇ ਹਿੱਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਸਾਬਤ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਅੰਤਰਰਾਸ਼ਟਰੀ ਤਾਕਤਾਂ ਤੇ ਸੰਯੁਕਤ ਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਦੀ ਸੁਰੱਖਿਆ ਕੌਂਸਲ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਮਤ ਸਮਝੇ ਕਿ ਮੋਦੀ ਦੀ ਜੰਗਵਾਜ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਸਿਰਫ ਲੋਕ ਸਭਾ ਚੋਣਾਂ ਜਿੱਤਣ ਲਈ ਇਸਤੇਮਾਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਅੰਤਰਰਾਸ਼ਟਰੀ ਤਾਕਤਾਂ ਤੇ ਸੰਯੁਕਤ ਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਦੀ ਸੁਰੱਖਿਆ ਕੌਂਸਲ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਮਤ ਸਮਝੇ ਕਿ ਮੋਦੀ ਦੀ ਜੰਗਵਾਜ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਸਿਰਫ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਚੋਣਾਂ ਜਿੱਤਣ ਲਈ ਇਸਤੇਮਾਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਦੋ ਤਿੰਨ ਤਿਹਾਈ ਬਹੁਮਤ ਨਿਸ਼ਾਨੇ ਹਾਸਲ ਕਰਨ ਪਿੱਛੋਂ ਘਟ ਗਿਣਤੀ ਕੌਮਾਂ ਤੇ ਨਿਵਾਹ ਸ਼ਰੀਅਮ ਤੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਪ੍ਰਵਾਨ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਤਿਆਰੀ ਵੀ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕੀ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਭਾਰਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਦਰੂਨੀ ਜੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਨਮ ਦੇ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਹੱਲ ਵੀ ਗਵਾਂਢੀ ਮੁਲਕਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਛੇੜ ਛੇੜ ਛੇੜਛਾੜ ਕਰਨਾ ਹੀ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਕਾਫੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਪ੍ਰਸ਼ਾਸਨ ਖੁਦ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਦੀ ਮਰਜ਼ੀ ਨਾਲ ਲੰਘਣਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਹਜ਼ਾਰਾਂ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਅਤੇ ਹਰੂ ਹੋਰ ਇਲਾਕਿਆਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਕਰਕੇ ਲਾਸ਼ਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਣਮਛਾਤੀਆਂ ਦੱਸ ਕੇ ਸਾੜ ਦੇਵੇ ਜਾਂ ਸੈਕੜੇ ਸਾਸੀ ਕੈਦੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਹਵਾਰੇ ਦੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਨਜ਼ਰਬੰਦ ਰੱਖੇ ਜਾਂ ਦਰਿਆਵ ਦੇ ਪਾਣੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਖੋਹ ਕੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਬੰਜਰ ਬਣਾ ਦੇਵੇ ਇਹ ਸਭ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਅੰਦਰ ਘਟ ਗਿਣਤੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੋ ਨੰਬਰ ਦੇ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਬਣਾ ਕੇ ਜਾਇਜ਼ੀ ਹੋ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਕਮੈਂਟਰੀ ਜਾਗਰਤਾ ਲਈ ਅਤਿ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਸਰਵਤ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਸਾਜੇ ਨਵਾਜੇ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਕਾਲਤਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਦੀ ਪਰ ਦਾ ਭਰਪੂਰ ਅਸ਼ੀਰਵਾਦ ਅਤੇ ਸ਼ੁਭ ਅਸ਼ਾਵਾਂ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਇਹ ਸੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਮਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਚਾਲ ਨੇ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਰੂਰ ਝਾਤ ਮਾਰੇ ਕੋ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਣੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਇਹਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਹੱਲ ਨਾ ਲੱਭਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੈਂਸਰ ਇੰਨੀ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਹੋ ਜਾਵੇਗੀ ਹਰ ਦੂਜਾ ਤੀਜਾ ਵਿਅਕਤੀ ਕੈਂਸਰ ਨਾਲ ਪੀੜਤ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਕਈ ਜ਼ਿਲ੍ਹਿਆਂ 'ਚ ਤਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਸੋ ਇਹਦੇ ਲਈ ਆਪਣੀ ਬਾਹਰ ਬਿਠਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਮੁਲਕ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਓ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਹਮ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਆਰਗੇਨਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਆਪਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤਾਲਮੇਲ ਕਰਕੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਜਿਹਦਾ ਪਾਣੀ ਦਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਆ ਖੁਦ ਮਖਤਿਆਰੀ ਦਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਧਾਰਮਿਕ ਲਿਟਰੇਚਰ ਰੱਖਣ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਉਮਰ ਕੈਦ ਹੋ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਤਿੰਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਤਿੰਨ ਕੁ ਮਹੀਨੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਇਹ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਆਪਣੇ ਲਈ ਨਮੂਨਾ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਇਸ ਬਾਤ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਆਪਾਂ ਕੰਮ ਵਾਰਲੇ ਦੇਸ਼ਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤਾਲਮੇਲ ਕਰਕੇ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸੁਰੱਖਿਆ ਕੌਂਸਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿੰਨੀਆਂ ਵੀ ਮੁਲਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਤੱਕ ਅਪਰੋਚ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਫਰੈਂਡਲੀ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਾਂ ਜੋ ਗਵਾਂਢੀ ਮੁਲਕ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤਾਲਮੇਲ ਵਧੀਆ ਬਣਾ ਕੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਇਹ ਮੁੱਦੇ ਆ ਉਠਾਏ ਜਾਣ ਤਾਂ ਜੋ ਉੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਲੋਕ ਆ ਉਹ ਆਜ਼ਾਦੀ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਸੁੱਖ ਦਾ ਸਾਹ ਲੈ ਸਕਣ ਇਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਮੇਰੀ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਆ ਇਹ ਕੰਮ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰਿਆਂ ਚੋਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਮ
ਸੋ ਹੁਣੇ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਕੋ ਵਕੀਲ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਇਸ ਲੈਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿਅਕਤੀ ਹਨ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਪੜ੍ਹਾਈ ਇਸ ਫੀਲਡ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈ ਸਮਹੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਪਲੇਟਫਾਰਮ ਤੇ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜੁਮੇ ਬਦਲਣੀ ਭਾਈ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਦਾ ਸੁਪਨਾ ਇਹ ਆ ਉਹਦਾ ਸੁਪਨਾ ਇਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਸਿਰਫ 2-4 ਆਗੂ ਹੀ ਸੈਕਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਸਿਆਣੇ ਬੰਦਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਦਾ ਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਕਿ ਸੈਕਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰੋ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਸੋ ਮੇਰੀ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਨੌਜਵਾਨ ਹਨ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਹਨ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਇਸ ਫੀਲਡ 'ਚ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਨ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਸਨਮਰ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮਸਲੇ ਮੈਂ ਆਪ ਉਹਰੇ ਰੱਖੇ ਬੜੇ ਗੰਭੀਰ ਹੈ ਇੱਧਰ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਧਿਆਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਤਾਂ ਦਾਸ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਖੇਮਾਂ ਦਾ ਜਦ ਕਿ ਬੁਲਾਰੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੈ ਸਮਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਥੋੜਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਥੋੜਾ ਜਿਹਾ ਲੈ ਗਿਆ ਭੁੱਲ ਚੁੱਕ ਦੀ ਖੇਮਾਂ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੂਜੇ ਕੋਮਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਮੇਰੇ ਵੀਰ ਭੈਣ ਆਏ ਹਨ ਆ ਵੁੱਡ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਆਲ ਅਦਰਸ ਹੂ ਕਮ ਫਰਮ ਅਦਰ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲਟੀਜ਼ ਔਰ ਅਦਰ ਫੇਸ ਆ ਵੁੱਡ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਥੈਮ ਫੋਰ ਕਮਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਥਿਸ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ and uh, standing with us in our hour of need thank you very much wai guruji ka khalsa wai guruji ki fateh ji dhanwad ji apne joga singh honan da jinhan ne kai saalan to inni vadhiya tarike naal qoum di seva kiti hai ਔਰ ਹੁਣ ਵੀ ਪ੍ਰੇਰਣਾ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਅਗਲੀ ਜਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਵੀ ਹੁਣ ਅੱਗੇ ਆਓ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਾਗਡੋਰ ਆ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਸੰਭਾਲੋ ਸਾਡੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮਸਲੇ ਆ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਸਵੇ ਨਿਰਣੇ ਦੇ ਆ ਖੁਦਮਖਤਿਆਰੀ ਦੇ ਪਾਣੀ ਦੇ ਧਰਮ ਦੇ ਇਹ ਸਾਰੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮੁੱਦੇ ਆ ਇਹ ਆਪਾਂ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲੈਵਲ ਤੇ ਲਿਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲਾਅ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 25 ਬੀ ਤੇ ਇੰਡੀਅਨ ਕਨਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਇਹ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਕੋਰਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਜਸਟੀਫਾਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਸਿੱਖ ਵਖਰੀ ਕੌਮ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਵਖਰੀ ਸੋਚ ਆ ਸਾਡਾ ਧਰਮ ਵਖਰਾ ਆ ਇਹ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਹਿੰਦੂਆ ਦਾ ਅੰਗ ਆ ਜੋ ਇੰਡੀਅਨ ਕਨਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਦਰਜ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਹੋ ਜਿਹੀਆਂ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਲਿਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਜੋਗਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਲਿਜਾਵਾਂਗੇ ਵੀ ਐਮ ਆਈ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਮੂਵ ਔਨ ਟੂ ਦ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਐਮ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਇਨਵਾਈਟ ਐਮ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ ਵਨ ਆਫ ਆਵਰ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਕਲ ਰੈਪਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟੇਟਿਵਸ ਹੂ ਆਰ ਹੀਅਰ ਟੂਡੇ ਐਮ ਵਿਲ ਕਮ ਬੈਕ ਔਨ ਟੂ ਅਦਰਸ ਐਸ ਵੈਲ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਮਿਕਸ ਇਟ ਅਪ ਇਫ ਆਈ ਕੈਨ ਆਈ ਨੋ ਸਮ ਆਫ ਦ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨਸ ਹੈਵ ਅਦਰ ਕਮਿਟਮੈਂਟਸ ਐਮ ਐਂਡ ਸੋ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਆਈ ਇਨਵਾਈਟ ਐਮ Phil Benyon from the Liberal Democrat Party. Um, Phil, do you want to come up? Um, I'm just going to give you a brief um, summary of what John Speller said. John Speller is a senior Labour MP um, who has served in the local Birmingham, West Midlands area for many, many years. Um, he couldn't make it personally today. And what he has done is he sent me a message i'm just going to quickly read it and then i'm going to read a letter that he's written to the foreign secretary about the issue we're discussing here today so john speller says i recognize and share the concerns of the sec community about the possible consequences of the current military tension between india and pakistan in kashmir and the deteriorating security situation we are rightly concerned that escalation could lead to major conventional conflict across the border and the geography of the region means that this would most likely be in the punjab naturally the sec community have deep concerns at the threat this poses to their families in punjab this is quite apart from the issue that both countries have nuclear capability and the consequences of this being used are horrendous
I'm, I'm not going to read all of the, John's letter to the Foreign Secretary. We met with John. We briefed him on the issue. He completely understands the concerns of the Sikhs in particular, but Kashmiris and others in the region as well. And he's written to the Foreign Secretary, and he's told him about the concerns that have been expressed to him, and that Punjab, the plains of Punjab, will be the likely theatre of any war between India and Pakistan. And the risk of it going nuclear is completely unacceptable and must be ruled out. So he's urged the Foreign Secretary to take up the role um, of bringing about de-escalation, both in a bilateral format and particularly, he says, at the United Nations. So thank you to John Speller. Um, that's the kind of message. Um, Dr. Wakar, you, you, you particularly endorse that in the, in the draft resolutions, that we should be looking to our political representatives to take this up at the international level. There are about 700,000 Sikhs in this country alone. I'm not sure, maybe somebody could give me a figure for the Kashmiris. Roughly the same? More? 800. 800,000 Kashmiris. So we're talking 1.5 million plus British people, people living here, who are anxious, who are worried, who are concerned about this issue. So why can't our political parties take this up? It's their duty to take it up. And it's our responsibility to put the point on their radar screen, to put the point on their agenda. So we're delighted to have representation. John Speller couldn't make it, but he's written to us, I think, in very, very strong terms. And we're looking for, Phil, we're looking for the Lib Dems to do similarly. And we've got um, Anthea McIntyre of the Conservative Party, um, and actually one of her colleagues with her as well, um, Ahmed Ijaz. So what we're looking, hopefully, is if you could briefly, we are running out of time, if you could briefly give us your view, and not just your view, please, my request, personal request, but your commitment to take this up at national level within your parties to bring this to their attention. Incidentally, I wrote to the Foreign Secretary. He couldn't make it, sends on his best wishes for the event. Um, but hopefully one day, and I briefed the, whole, I, I briefed the Foreign Secretary, I briefed about this event, I briefed neighboring countries. They chose not to come or send their representatives. Maybe that's understandable, but we're breaking that narrative, Dr. Wakar. We are going to break that narrative where our voices as a stateless nation, because that's what the Sikhs are. We are a nation, but we're stateless. The Kashmiris are a stateless nation. We're going to break that narrative, and we will get these people attending one day. And it's in their own interests. But for the time being, Phil, can I ask you to come and speak a bit about your views and the Lib Dems, what they have to say on this? Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Phil Bennion, and uh, I used to be um, a member of the European Parliament until 2014, and at that time I was the Liberal Group spokesperson on South Asia. Um, now, South Asia included um, everything but India, if you like. It was, uh, we had Pakistan, uh, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Maldives. Uh, but India had its own delegation, so um, uh, it was limited what I could uh, do on the Sikh front, but I did quite a, quite a bit. Um, firstly, I'm going to speak a little bit about human rights. Now, uh, I'm a member of Liberal International's Human Rights Committee, and uh, in that uh, respect, I've twice spoken at the United Nations. Um, I'm given a brief what to speak on. One of them was calling for the release of Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia when he was leader of the opposition. If you remember, he was imprisoned. He's now free. Um, and the other one was actually on domestic violence in Russia. But um, when I was in the European Parliament, my focus was largely on Kashmir, uh, to a lesser extent on the Sikhs, and also uh, quite a lot on Bangladesh. Uh, but the whole, whole region kept me busy because we also had the aftermath of the civil war in Sri Lanka. 
Um, and and uh, my, my main issues in uh, Kashmir were the uh, disappearances, um, the, the perpetual in out of imprisonment of Yazin Malik, and uh, also the use of uh, by India of the death penalty, and in, in one or two ex uh, uh, um, situations without giving access to the, the families. So a lot of these issues were directly just human rights issues. Uh, with the Sikhs, um, I very much took up the case of Balwant Singh, who was uh, threatened with the death penalty. We're not suggesting the, that he was not uh, in any way a criminal, but uh, the death penalty is something we absolutely abhor and oppose. And uh, so I, I addressed a Sikh rally in Place Luxembourg in, in Belgium and also marched at the head of a column of Sikhs in Wolverhampton calling for the Indian government to drop its threat of the, uh, the death penalty against Balwant Singh. Now, uh, when it comes to um, uh, democracy and self-determination, um, my own view is that uh, the right of voting, the right to organise, the right to... Uh, take, con take democratic control is as much a human right as these other human rights. Uh, and in that respect, uh, I've managed to get that uh, ele elevated uh, for Liberal International, which is the global group of Liberal parties, um, to one of its key, um, one of it, one of its key aims. Um, with, uh, with, the, with the situation um, of self-determination for the Sikhs, my view is very, very clear. It's, uh, as long as they're, they're clearly a, uh, a recognisable group op op occupying a, a recognisable area of land, uh, so the, the, the test would be whether democratically there would be a, a majority uh, for self-determination. And uh, as long as there is, then I would absolutely back it. Now, we've had to deal with this within the uh, Liberals in Europe because we had the situation in Spain where we had the Basque and the Catalan nationalists inside the Liberal group, but also the, the most outspoken unionist party in Spain through Dodanus, also in the same group. So we actually had to come up with some uh, clear uh, and, and rational uh, solutions as to in what circumstances we would back self-determination. And that's what I've just given you. As long as there is a majority for self-determination, de we absolutely back it. Now, in the situation in Kashmir, many of you will know that I have been pushing for uh, a, new, uh, a new settlement, a new initiative uh, on Kashmir that rather stalled when I lost my seat in 2014, but I have actually kept it on the back burner and kept pushing it whenever, I had the, whenever, I, whenever I've had the chance. Now, my view here is that the Kashmiris should look for autonomy uh, first. I mean, you can go a long way towards uh, independence, with, um, as we've seen with Scotland. Um, so you first of all push for autonomy, and I'm talking about autonomy for the whole of Kashmir, uh, not just the Indian part. Um, so uh, when I met um, Imran Khan, uh, while he was still in opposition, um, I, I told him that I thought that the solution to Kashmir was a, a strong and uh, generous um, approach from the Pakistani government to the Indian government, because without that, India would not even talk. India would not budge. Um, so what I wanted him to say that was, was that Pakistan would re revoke all of its interests in Azad Kashmir, um, if India would allow this, um, uh, th th this cross-border um, autonomy, uh, they would, both groups, both the India and Pakistan would in the, in initially be allowed to keep troops in, but uh, across Kashmir you had have an autonomous government looking after everything except foreign policy in the first instance. That would be as a, uh, as a, uh, a precondition uh, to, to go further later towards full independence. Uh, now, in the UK, we of course don't have unity within the Kashmiri community for how to go forward. And so every time I've spoken to Kashmiri groups, 
uh, in the UK, I've told them to drop this idea of Pakistan is Kashmir and Kashmir is Pakistan. Because as long as you go along that route, India will not budge. India is, a, is, is too powerful, far too powerful to wrest Kashmir, wrest Indian controlled Kashmir from them to, for it to join Pakistan. That is not going to happen in my lifetime, in your life, even in the youngest person here's lifetime. So let's go for something that actually can work and uh, what has worked in the past in other areas against all the odds is that uh, areas have peacefully come to independence but not, you never see um, a, 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 an area of land and, an area, and, and a group of people transferred from a powerful state to a less powerful state. In, in real politics, that is not going to happen. So we should push, we should unite in the first place. Kashmiris should unite around the idea of, of self-determination, not to join Pakistan, but to be this independent buffer state, which one of the earlier speakers uh, pointed out. Now, there has to be assurances, because basically Kashmir, there's so much, so much of the water that uh, both Pakistan and India uh, rely on, um, and thereby also a lot of the, elect uh, the hydroelectric power uh, emanates from Kashmir. So there needs to be a broad, uh, a broad spectrum treaty on which this is based. So this is the way I would like to see this go forward. But uh, it's not going to happen as long as India fears that Kashmir would simply jump into Pakistan. Because the, in, in, their, in, in their own ideas of zero-sum politics, uh, that would be losing far too much face. They just won't do it. So, but even in unlikely circumstances, we've seen uh, independence movements succeed. So we should push around the independence movement, uh, and, and I think that is, again, this buffer state idea is, is really uh, something to, to work for. Now, again, with the Sikhs, I would push, the, urge them to it, it, democratically try and get enough uh, support within uh, what you call Khalistan, the area of the Punjab that is in India, um, get enough support to actually run the local provinces and, get, and, get, and, and so that you're in charge. Um, you actually have to use all the democratic processes you can. And at the moment, with India having this Hindu, Hindu nationalist type of government, um, there is every reason for you to be able to garner democratic support for, uh, for more devolution, and more devolution can be a precursor to independence and, and, and creating another, another buffer state. Finally, I'd just like to say something on this nuclear issue. Uh, I mean, we, we, yes, we have a, it, it is a, a, um, such a threat to world peace, not just peace in the Indian sub, subcontinent. Um, uh, and, but I certainly wouldn't want to see uh, military intervention uh, by outside forces going in there. That's probably going to make things worse. Um, but we have, to w we have to work diplomatically uh, and try and take the steam out of it. Now, the Indian election coming up has not helped things because it means that the um, Modi's group have, ha have been sort of beating the drum more, more than is healthy. Uh, but possibly after the election might be a better time to start uh, looking to defuse the situation. I, I have to say that Imran Khan so far has uh, exceeded my expectations in his handling of the crisis, but um, you know, he, he's, he's been a little bit un, um, unreliable in his, his sort of emotional responses in the past, and we don't know how long his, his sort of stable... Um, control at the moment has, has, is going to last. But he's done pretty well so far. So let's hope that after the Indian election we can get the two together within, within the scope of the United Nations that we should be putting forward uh, our help as much as we can. And, and the EU can put forward its help as well. Remember that the European Union actually has an ethical foreign policy. I don't know if you remember Robin Cook's ideas of an ethical foreign policy for Britain, but the EU has this ethical foreign policy. It uses human rights and democracy. Um, it uses its own power, its own trade, its own access to markets, its GSP+, plus general system of preferences, to actually push forward on human rights and democracy. So let's, ever, let's get all of those forces together and see if we can get a peaceful resolution to this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil.
Um, some uh, some good, good original thinking, some good analysis there. Not everybody's going to agree with everybody else, so we're open to thinking and analysis and ideas. So I'm grateful for you for, for taking the time out and joining us today. Um, I, I do hope that uh, this is something that you could take back to your, to your party leadership. It's an issue that, that absolutely needs to be addressed. I've got to suggest that. I, I'm actually on our, um, I'm vice chair of our international relations committee, so I'll get a direct access to Joe Swinson, who's currently sure. our uh, foreign affairs spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, I can get hold of her any time I want and, and put these ideas forward. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we've got a, quite a lot of other speakers to come on, um, but I am going to put, um, if I may, I may uh, get Anthea to speak next. I think Anthea is one of those who needs to move to other commitments. So um, Anthea McIntyre is an MEP of the Conservative Party and is standing again for, the, for election at the European Parliament forthcoming elections. Um, I believe Anthea has had a an interest in South Asia. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, she'll come with, with her ideas and hopefully, as with Phil, a commitment to take this up at the Conservative Party higher level. Thank you. You okay? That's fine. Well, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honour to be with you today. And I want to thank you, Ranjit, for organising this conference. It is a hugely important topic. And we've heard some really quite inspiring words from speakers earlier. I'm particularly pleased, I think he's had to go, that um, Dr. Chima was yeah. here. I very much enjoyed hearing him. And another quick call out, I have to say, I'm delighted to see Jaspreet Singh sitting there, who was um, in the chair of the Students' Union of BCU mm -hmm. and helped with organising a conference that I ran in Birmingham. So it's, it's, it's great to see quite a number of friends in the audience today. And I'm also joined by a colleague, Ahmed Ijaz, who is on our list of candidates for the European elections, which are coming up rather more quickly than I would have liked. <laughs> but um, I don't particularly think I need to talk about European elections, but I do need to talk about what we're doing in the EU as members of the European Parliament. I think I want to start um, just from the... to recognise the, the seriousness of the situation in South Asia. Um, as has already been said, we have three nuclear powers and we have a rising of tension um, and potential conflict between Pakistan and India, which should be worrying everyone. Um, I was very relieved when the Indian pilot who was shot down was actually returned by Pakistan to India. I thought that was a very good gesture. And I have to say, I am pleased that our minister for the UK government, Mark Field, played a part in that too. Now, what I am keen to say on all these matters is that I believe that the, the strength of our approach has been having an all-party uh, approach to the situation in, in India, Pakistan, Kashmir. So I'm very proud to be co-chair of the um, European Friends of Kashmir group in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. So we work across party, but we, which gives us a strength that we might not otherwise have. And um, late last year, I visited Kashmir um, and I went to the line of control, and I could see for myself the, the difficulties, the dangers, and also the appalling human rights abuses. It cannot be right when we see young children maimed and blinded by pellet guns. We, we have a duty, I feel, to stand up and 
demand action and maintain our demand for human rights regardless of who or where, whether it's the Uyghurs in China or the Rohingyas in Myanmar or uh, the awful regime in Iran, which executes more people per capita, men, women and children. So the human rights abuses across the world should, con should concern all of us. I'm not going to quote too much, but one of my absolute all-time favourite poets is a chap called John Donne from the 17th century. And he wrote that no man is an island entire of itself. Everyone is a piece of the continent, a part of the whole. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And that's very much how I feel we should all approach the question of human rights and the atrocities that are committed. And I have to say, as a member of the European Parliament, it is quite true that the European Parliament and the European Union puts great emphasis on human rights. But it doesn't always carry it out. It doesn't always stand up for the rights of those that are abused. And I have been quite critical of the importance that the EU places on trade. But for me, it cannot be trade at any price. And some of the prices that we are being asked to pay in terms of the diminishment of human rights is a price too high. So I have been critical of uh, Mrs. Morgherini, the, representative, the high representative, the equivalent of a foreign secretary in Europe. And I have, throughout my so far seven years as a member of the European Parliament, I have sat on the delegation for relations with India. Now, this has enabled me to visit India and sit in the Indian Parliament and actually ask the question, what are we going to do to solve the particular difficulties with Kashmir? What are you going to do? And I met with absolute stony silence and um, a suggestion that I should leave because this wasn't appropriate for discussion. I will not be silenced as a politician. I will continue to stand up for human rights and I will demand that politicians across the world take notice. So I think that here in this country, it is very important that we raise awareness just as you are doing for the needs of the Sikh nation. And I fully support self-determination for all peoples. It's up to those nations to decide for themselves what they want to do. Um, and as we saw in the case of Scotland, mm -hmm. if, if we can give Scotland a vote on their self-determination, then why can't we give it to the Sikhs and the people of Kashmir and all peoples that want to have a say in their own futures. So I will continue to do that. And let me also say here in this country, I started an organization in the West Midlands called West Midlands Together. And I did this with representatives from the Labour Party and from the Liberal Democrats. Again, all party. And we're working to show that hate crime has no place particularly within our politics. We have to remember that politics can be dangerous. You only have to look at the tragedy of Joe Cox. So it is important that all politicians say hate crime is completely abhorrent to us and we will all stand for peace and a peaceful solution. So I promise you I will continue to do this in the European Parliament and in my capacity as your member of the European Parliament representing the West Midlands. I will continue to stand up for the people of Kashmir and happy to do whatever I can for the Sikhs, both within my party and hopefully for a, a little while longer in the European Parliament. And all I would say at the end to, to say all of these things come from our hearts. 
And one of my favorite quotations is actually from Gandhi, who says, be the change you want to see in the world. And that's what we can all do as politicians or individuals. Be the change, stand for peace. And that's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to Anthea, who I think was very, very uh, refreshing in the sense that we have a commitment to take up these issues. She's endorsed everything that we've asked her to endorse. And she's committed to take it up with her party, both at European level and generally. So I'm really grateful for, for what you've said. Appreciate that. Um, before I turn to Professor Scholl, um, who is a long-standing expert on South Asia, uh, very widely respected um, campaigner and analyst, and I might add, supporter of the, the Sikh. And, you know, as a Kashmiri sitting next to the Sikhs, shoulder to shoulder, facing the same issues, not just of our self-determination struggles in Punjab and Kashmir respectively, but also facing this threat of annihilation, frankly, because of the warmongering of uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi and his party. So we'll, we'll hear from you shortly, uh, Professor Shaw. But before then, I'd like to call um, Gurpreet Singh of Saving Punjab, um, so, Gurpreet Singh, I don't know. Gurpreet Singh is going to address the issue from a Sikh perspective. Um, and maybe I think he's a youngster who's got some technology. So, uh, maybe he'll impress us with some slides. We'll see. Uh, Gurpreet Singh, please. Is it quite easy? Is it quite easy? Yeah. Computer this way. Yeah. Take it on the That light. Yeah. Why Guruji ka Khalsa? Why Guruji ki Fateh? My name is Gurpreet Singh. Um, I work a part of an organisation called Saving Punjab that is currently working within Punjab and working on many issues that are going on within Punjab. So our organization is looking at statistical figures within Punjab to see what is going on with the minorities within Punjab. Today I'm going to be talking about a few issues. I'm going to talk about uh, the British rule. I'm going to be talking about the independence within India. And I'm going to be speaking about current Punjab, specifically talking about five issues within Punjab. So my talk will consist of 10 minutes. I'm going to be covering a lot of issues. Um, within these issues, the, the actual subject is quite broad, but I am going to kind of go over them very briefly. So the first of my issues uh, is going to be speaking about uh, the Sikh Empire, going on to the British rule, and then independence, the post-independence, and current Punjab. In 1849, the British invaded India and in, in the end, Punjab was the last place 
or the Sikh Empire was the last place to fall to the British rule. On the map you can see that was roughly around the borderlines of where the Sikhs ruled. And because of Punjab falling or the Sikh Empire falling, there was Anglo-Sikh wars. And many of these were fought by fearless Sikh warriors that died fighting against the British for their independence. Now this independence eventually did come but at a cost. So leading up to this independence, there was many movements that started. And these movements were the Gadri movement and the Babarakalis. So the Babarakalis and the Gadri movements were the, the movements that were fighting against the British for independence. Now this independence was for the places of worship to be independent so that they could have their rights within India. And statistically speaking, the amount of contributions that the Sikhs gave or the Punjabis gave for the independence for India and Pakistan were huge. The statistics show from around 4,771 that died, 3,697 of them were Sikhs. And statistically speaking, that is eight, around 88%. So the contributions of these people, of the Punjabis and the Sikh people, was huge. So the Sikhs had their empire, the Sikhs lost it, and then they fought for it, and they fought for their independence against the British. Which came to the partition. Now, the main place affected, as Dr. Chima mentioned before, was Punjab. Many of the people died, were across, crossing that border from West Punjab to current Punjab. Most of the conflicted area was of that Punjab, but the huge part of this was, Punjab was div div divided down the middle. So those people that lived within Punjab were lost from their families from each side. And you can see across Punjab, there was a lot of conflict across the areas of Punjab. Now further, after the independence, Punjab was then further divided. So the original Punjab was then further divided after 1947 and then after 1971 again, Punjab was divided. Right, so after the independence, Punjab was divided again in many issues and then the the Sikhs that stayed within India, again, had to face many issues. So Punjab, the whole of India was reconstructed on a bilingual basis, and Punjab was given the, the, the state where Punjabi is spoken. Now, the Sikhs started to protest because Punjabi, the main language of Punjab, was taken away from them. And over 40,000, I think the figure is a lot higher, but around 40,000 people caught at arrest. Many died fighting for the rights of their language. Now coming to today's event, we're talking about war, we're talking about peace, how we want peace amongst these two nations that are going up against each other. Statistically speaking, India and Pakistan have been at war every 20 or so years. So you can see 1947, 1965, 1971, 1999. The correlation shows that a war is amongst us within the next few years. That's statistics speaking. And Pulmama was a prime example of India and Pakistan going ahead at each other. Now that is just the wars. How many conflicts, how many stand-ups has India and Pakistan had amongst each other? <laughs> Standoffs. Many. And those people living within Kashmir or living within Punjab are always on edge thinking, okay, when's war going to break out? When do we have to think about our livelihood? When do we have to move? When can we keep our family safe? And that anxiety hangs over Punjabis today and Kashmiris. So what do we want? In terms of saving Punjab, we're going to talk about current issues in Punjab today. 
But Punjabis do not want war. I don't think Kashmiris want either. But Punjab is expendable for India. India does not care for Punjab and we will prove that to you statistically today. Punjab is deliberately being targeted across many issues within India. And eventually, if Punjab was to go to war, it would be a great loss. Also for Kashmiris. Okay, so the five issues of current issues I'm going to talk to you today are, st are a statistical analysis of what is going on currently in Punjab. So the first issue I'm going to talk about is drugs. So before I start, I want to speak about Punjab today. The current Punjab covers about 1.5% of the geographical area of India. This 1.5 geographical area, we're going to speak about how this contributes to so many issues within Punjab. And why is Punjab important to the Sikhs? Punjab is where 75% of the world's Sikh population live. So if Punjab is affected, the whole Sikh nation is affected. Okay, so the following image is a document from the CIA reports and it talks about international drug trafficking amongst the world and the area to highlight is the golden crescent which is directly above the india pakistan and afghanistan region and you can see within this region punjab plays a pivotal role within the golden crescent as drugs are trafficked trafficked from afghanistan to pa pakistan and then they enter india by the punjab corridor Punjab is the corridor for drugs entering India. And you can see specifically Amritsar because it's a border region, is one of the places where drugs enter India and then are distributed to the rest of India. Now what effects are, are this what effects is this have, having amongst the Punjabis? Statistics show from the Guru Nanak University report that 73% of the rural youth are addicted to some kind of drug. Punjab's youth currently are facing many, many problems in terms of drugs. And that is specifically, specifically because of that drug corridor. And India's lack of intervention to stop that from happening. So the statistics show that from 2000 and 2015, you can see how the transformation from where largely opium drugs were used, and now 90% of the addicts are using heroin. So how the drugs are intensifying. And this last slide on drugs, I want you to pay particular attention to, which shows that from 2011 to 2014, 50% of all drug seized throughout the whole of India were from Punjab. This 1.5 geographical area, this small percentage is where 50% of the drugs are being seized. If that is an area of concern for India, what is? Moving on to the second topic, which is water. Water was mentioned a few times today. But specifically speaking about what Nasser is saying, Nasser is saying that Punjab, Rajasthan should be very worried about the water. The water table is dropping. Now, why is it dropping? There's many reasons. It can link to agriculture, it can link to diverted water, which is causing the ground level of water to decrease. So, the water of Punjab is actually unsafe as it is. Statistics show that Punjab's water is high on uranium, which is causing other effects. And also, the water of Punjab is being overpumped from ground levels. The reason of overpumping is because of agriculture uses, but also because the water is being diverted to other states. Now, you can see the graph directly to the top left. It says that the Punjab's water has decreased massively from the 1980s to 2000. And Punjab, you can clearly see, is 172% when it comes to the state that consumes more than it can recharge. 
simply because Punjab contributes to <coughs> India's agriculture. And in terms of irrigation, Punjab is the highest amongst all India states. So if anyone needs water, it's Punjab. But again, we know Punjab's water is being diverted through this Satluj and Yamuna Canal. So we need water, but it's been taken away so that other states can use the water. Now Punjab contributes to 50% of the agriculture that goes in terms of grain, the wheat and paddy to the center. And that's just from this 1.5 geographical area. Now, the highest rate of farmer suicide from 2015 in terms of percentage increase is of the, of the Punjabi people. This 1.5 geographical area is where most of these farmers are committing suicide. Now speaking about pesticides, right. In 2018, the Punjab government banned over 20 pesticides that the World Health Organization had banned many years ago. They're deemed hazardous, and still Punjab's government is using them pesticides that have a direct link to cancer, have a direct link to infertility, impotency, and many, many other health problems. Which goes on to the, the topic of cancer. <laughs> this picture image you see here is from the MBC News. And the MBC News saying is, Punjab is the capital cancer of India. Per population, there are more people suffering from, from cancer in Punjab than anywhere else. And if that isn't a shock to the Indians, that a 1.5 geographical area is contributing to the high percentage of cancer within India, and there is no specialist cancer hospital within Punjab. Some of you might have heard of the cancer train, where a cancer tr a train goes from uh, Punjab to Rajasthan, so people could be cured for cancer outside of the state. Whereas there's such a high population of cancer within India, or within Punjab, and people are going elsewhere to be treated. And this has a direct link to the pesticides being used from studies, especially in the Malwa area. So just, just a point to think on that, Punjab, the Sikhs had Punjab, the Sikhs ruled, the Sikhs fought back for, for, for Punjab, they fought for the independence against the British, they were divided into two, then again divided again, and then now the 75% population of Sikhs within Punjab are suffering again from these issues. And then last of my topics of issues to speak to, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking very briefly upon these topics. These topics are quite complex um, in terms of the depth of them and understanding the overall problem. I'm basically touching upon these problems because I don't have the time here to speak in depth on them. But these problems are a lot more complex than we can see. Fertility amongst India. Now, the fertility amongst Kashmir and Punjab is a lot lower than any other states. And the reason for this is, uh, one of the reasons is the 200,000 uh, deaths that were because of the, the genocide over the last 35 years within Punjab. And that is causing a lot of post-dramatic uh, stress. And you, could, you can see clearly that Punjab has a low fertility rate. If you look at the statistics of Punjab's fertility rate, it's, it's absolutely low. Now comparing the statistics of fertility to language was one of the uh, correlations that was seen amongst the studies. And this is the overall fertility rate within India. And you can see the area where there's a high fertility rate is in red, and the low fertility rate is in blue. Now, the fertility rate has a direct link to drug addictions, uh, which is causing a lot of the Punjabis to have uh, infertility. But directly linking the fertility rates to language, you can see the correlation or where Hindi is spoken, the fertility is high, and those states that don't speak Hindi, the fertility rate is low. Now, this is not my assessment, this is just something I came upon, but I'd like you to think upon yourself what the correlation might be between the language and fertility rates. So, 
just to conclude, I've kind of briefly spoke upon many points um, within India and Punjab. Punjab is already drowning at the hands of the Indian government. Nuclear exchange will be detrimental for Punjab and Punjabis. Punjab falls in a place where it is very, very dangerous. You know, Bill Clinton says it's the most dangerous place in the world, the Indian-Pakistan border. But especially because of China having nuclear powers, Pakistan having nuclear powers, and India having nuclear powers. Punjab would suffer, also Kashmir would, at the hands of nuclear war. Therefore, our plea for this conference is that war should be off the table, dialogue should take place on the international law, and for dialogue to take place for self-determination for Punjab and Kashmir. Nobody wants war, everyone wants peace, but that dialogue needs to take place amongst India. India needs to realize that there is no other way. We don't want violence, we just want peace. And in terms of this, they need to recognize the international law and understand that the human rights of Punjabis are a priority and Kashmiris is a priority and that these states that want to self-determinate, they should be given the chance to do so. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa. Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Thanks to uh, Gurpreet Singh, excellent contribution. Um, it's interesting, I, some of those correlations are, do make you think. Um, Punjab, as many Sikhs will know, has been targeted <coughs> since 1947. Um, and they, the Indian policy is effectively to be, to neutralize, to completely liquidate the interests of the Sikhs as a nation. And we've just seen some evidence of that. Uh, and if we extrapolate that into a war situation where nuclear weapons are used, then actually there'll be nothing left, e even of what's, what we've seen there. There will be literally nothing left of Punjab and indeed Kashmir. So it's just underlined the need that we cannot, as Faisal said in his closing remarks, war must be off the table. And the warmongers in the Indian subcontinent need to take note. We will hold them to account. War has to be off the table. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who is, uh, I mentioned earlier, Professor uh, Nazir Ahmed Shaw, an expert on the region. Charles, if I could, do you want to please come here? Go ahead. Oh, okay. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Ranjit Singh Sarai, who has been working with me for a long time. And I would say, and I usually say it whenever I begin my deliberation, I say, you have been very generous, sir. And generosity becomes more generous when generously responded to. So I have generously responded to your generosity. One more thing that I would like to say, and in fact pay tribute, Dr. Shtima is not here, but I would like to pay my tribute to him for the honesty of his intellect and his, uh, what we call, open-mindedness. Basically, Sikhs and Muslims have one thing very common. Alama Iqbal said, Ek mard kamil ne jagaya khob se ek sada tawheed ki uthi si jab Punjab se. So, question is, tawheed is our 
oneness, unity of God mm -hmm. is one of our common factor that, that unites us. But my dear Ranjit, I have specifically chosen the topic, the topic that you had suggested, that is South Asia, an inevitable weapons playground or a case of international intervention. So while coming to this place, I have penned down some of my stray thoughts on the subject and tried to do it in a, a, a very briefly. So I would be doing that, but before doing that, I would tell you that it is not only the nuclear war that poses a danger to the very existence of the subcontinent or South Asia. It is the ideology of a regime which is deliberately trying to change the demography in Kashmir and it, it is also polarizing India and persecuting the minorities. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, needs to be classified. He began his career as a Chalak of Rastriya Soyam Sevak Sangh. And this needs to be told to the international community. We all must strive for it that in India we have a dispensation settled in Delhi, which is the political face of Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, an organization that is a terrorist organization that was banned. It is this organization which killed Gandhi. And now it, is, it has also killed the Indian secular polity. Secularism at present is a myth in India. This needs to be understood and this needs to be uh, told everywhere. So this ideology of Hindutva is also a threat to peace of the region and also to international peace. When I am referring to Prime Minister Modi, I am referring to the doctrine that he is following in the disputed state of Jammu and Kashmir. And here, I would also like to say that self-determination is not a conditional uh, right. Self-determination is an unfettered, inalienable, basic birthright. Therefore, I respect the opinions expressed here. And one of the, one of the speakers also uh, made some suggestions and uh, poured out his wisdom. But uh, I, would, I would say that our struggle, the struggle of the people of Jammu and Kashmir is for right of self determination and this time, what's being done in, by India is that they are pursuing a doctrine. This doctrine is called Doval Doctrine. Doval Doctrine has op two operational ways. One of the, one of the ways is that uh, they are physically, they are physically trying to harass the people and try to put them to atrocious phenomena. They are using catch and search operation on one side and on the other side they are making constitutional massacre. They are bent upon changing the article 35A and the article 370 and if you go through the BJP manifesto they promise to the, their voters that vote for BJP and we will, uh, we will give you land in Kashmir. Although top Indian constitutional experts are of the opinion that if 370 or 35A is removed, 
is scissored out from Indian constitution, Indian constitution will lose its meaning. The whole constitution will crumble. But in spite of all these things, they are bent upon uh, they are bent upon this rhetoric and they are, they are saying that they will abrogate these articles. So this is also a big challenge, a challenge to negate the right to self embrace of the people of Kashmir by changing the Kashmir demography. Coming to South Asia and to the threat of a, a nuclear war, I would say South Asia is a home for over a billion people, but it is plagued with numerous conflicts. Over the years, these conflicts have eclipsed the possibility of durable peace and prosperity in the region. Human rights of the people are violated in the conflict areas. It is essential that the international community should intervene and UN needs to play a proactive role by invoking the international human rights instruments and mechanisms. UN role is also needed to address the self-determination struggles, such as self-determination struggle in Kashmir, self-determination struggle in other parts. There are uh, more than 15 to 20 uh, movements going on, and particularly I'm uh, referring here to struggle for self-determination in Kashmir and struggle for self-determination for a Punjab homeland. Creating, you know, we need to create a thought construct, a positive thought construct for peace building, stability, and security of the region by seeking cooperation of governments is a worth achieving challenge. We all present here today in this conference have to be part of a global movement for peace building measures in South Asian region. The prospect of a nuclear war cannot be ruled out. Recent events in South Asia have strengthened this fear. Post Pulwama developments need a critical evaluation. The
done uh, just without the intervention of international community. International community has, has intervened uh, that this escalation must not go. But the thing that has to be seen is that Modi, the uh, <clears throat> political face of RSS, is pushing, is pushing India to a, to a situation that, uh, th that, uh, that is what we call uh, uh, giving him votes. He tries, to, he tries to sell this. He tries to sell this war mongering. And uh, the international community must take notice of, notice of this uh, as well. Lastly, just to conclude, I would say, Kashmir is closely tied up to the issue of nuclear proliferation in South Asia, which is being realized in various quarters. As long as Kashmir keeps India and Pakistan relations on tenter hooks, cooperation in conventional weapons and increased emphasis on cognizable defense will continue to dictate defense policies in both countries. Such a scenario puts accent on a regional approach to issue of non-proliferation. That is why, why your uh, plea for a dialogue enters. And dialogue is better than, we see somebody has rightly said that words are better than munitions. And dialogue is better than what we silence. So the dialogue must be present in those dialogues. Thank you for giving me a... <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Pop up. Can you just leave her again? Introduce me? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Shaw. Uh, always uh, uh, wise words from a man who knows the region inside out. Um, we have got to move on. We're behind schedule. We've still got a number of speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Graham, Graham Wilkinson, who is chair of, is chair of Nations Without States, which is an organization that is actually devoted to the concept of self-determination. I'd just like to say one thing about self-determination. Self-determination for the Sikhs means uh, exercising our sovereignty, our kodamukhtiari, as we put it, in the form of an independent state in Punjab. And there are various ways and means of achieving that. We've got, there's a referendum 2020 campaign going on to, uh, as an informal way of testing the public mood and sending out a message to the world that the Sikhs actually do want to exercise self-determination in the form of independence. But it's, this is not just about, self-determination is more than that. Self-determination is not just about determining your political destiny. It's also about Controlling your, your present, not just your future. And as a concept, self-determination, Graham, I believe, covers the fact that if it's our homeland and our people that are in the line of fire, then surely self-determination covers that issue as well. And as Professor Shaw says, as a stakeholder, we need to be at the table and we need to be sending out the message that no third party has the right to conduct its wars on our homeland and on our populations. So, Graham, please. Thank you, Ranjit. Uh, thank you to all the speakers that have been on so far. The problem is when you do these speeches and, and discussions, most of it's been said before. If I was only going to say one thing, I would say that Dr. Chi, Chima is not mad as he suggested, but a visionary. Because he's talking about something which should have been introduced many years before, and hopefully it will in the future. But very briefly then, um, I just wrote some notes down about, everyone of course says they believe in peace. You know, there's not too many people publicly say we want war. Except Modi. Except Modi. 
But merely saying so does make it, doesn't make it happen. You know, it's just platitudes. It's what we would desire. But obviously, we, want, we live for other things. Self-determination obviously has been mentioned. We could spend hours discussing why do we need self-determination? Why do people feel they're different from another people? The culture's been different in the history. But we haven't got time for that. But it's clear uh, in nation without states belief that if you want peace or one form of peace, one of the conditions to making it happen is in fact recognition and application of the principle of self-determination. In other words, where people choose how and by whom they should be governed. It's a failure of governments and international agencies to resolve issues of national identity and sovereignty that ensures global peace remains a pipe dream. It is not a coincidence that some of the longest running conflicts in the modern world are cessationist struggles, Kashmiris, Tibetans, Kurds, Tamils, it goes on and the Sikhs would probably put themselves in that struggle. Maybe it's peaceful at, at this moment in time. Some are violent, some are peaceful, but all have the capacity to escalate to violence and, and various repression. Few were, wars now occur between borders. Few involve invasions or bombardments of cross frontiers. Perhaps the last example was the Allied invasion of um, Iraq. You might include, say, the Turkish invasion of northern Syria, but that was ostensibly via, via rebel proxies. Very few countries now say, we're going to invade our neighbours. They use proxies, they use groups with inside countries. Most warlike situations are actually due to internal division. Some of it political, such as Libya, where, where there's various sides want to take power. But most of it is self-determination. Peoples who've been struggling for centuries uh, for their, their land, Kashmiris, uh, um, Khalistan, and many and hill tribes in India. And there's probably about 100 or so going on now around the world. But you don't hear about it because the world elites don't want you to hear about it because they'd rather keep the status quo. So I think political differences probably can never be resolved. But struggles for self-determination can be. If the world's international agencies, if the world states accepted that it is a matter of national justice, and that if you don't solve those problems, these wars will go on forever. Sikhs, until Sikhs disappear as a people, that struggle will continue. Until Kashmiris disappear as a people, that conflict will continue forever. Uh, so if you really genuinely want peace, or if the states want peace, they need to look, reach out for, uh, to look for self-determination, some deals with the people. Now in theory, what we would like in principle is a UN supervised referendum throughout the whole world, where it's necessary, where people ask for it. There should be that. Will we get it? Well, I think it was been mentioned by uh, that Phil before, that India will block that because they'd fear that what the result would be not what they would like. We've had a referendum in Britain recently and look at the problems that that's caused with division with people not accepting that result. So India wouldn't want to be in position of allowing it, losing it, and then saying, oh, well, no, we didn't really want that. So it is very difficult. Um, and maybe, of course, countries, it's another story, like to change the demographics. And we know that that's a problem around the world where they think, well, okay, if we ever had a referendum, we'd lose it. But let's bring in our own people, Han Chinese into Zhang. Hang Chinese into Tibet, uh, Hindus into uh, uh, Kashmir, etc., etc. But that's that's another story. Um, very quickly, Kashmir is really the sore at the moment, and has been for a long time for India and Pakistan. And that's the reason why, obviously, you've got the conflict between those two states, um, and that's not going away. We've mentioned before, been four wars at least, and many skirmishes between them and it keeps continuing. I was noted that our friend here mentioned about every 20 years there seems to be a conflict. Well, um, there's lots of theories about destiny and, and things being repeated and that may be, may be the case and sadly that we may be going down that line. But of course this conference was about where would the escalation stop? Would it go nuclear? Of course um, the area is divided by religion in the period of a rise of religious fundamentalism, that's a problem. Um, and of course, they both have nuclear weapons. 
In reality, of course, the fact of possession is not really the problem because at least nine countries around the world, maybe more, have got nuclear weapons. We've never had a nuclear exchange between countries uh, for lots of re obvious reasons, of course, but we've been close to it, the Cuba crisis. We're very close to uh, using nuclear weapons, so you can't rule it out. Um, and, but, of course, recently, in, up to recently, India kept most of its responses internally. Repression and security issues in Kashmir and obviously in Khalistan and, and other places uh, around India. But since Modi was elected, the people behind him, the Hindu nationalists, have wanted more than that. So even the recent uh, response to the Kashmir bombing was uh, an escalation, in my opinion. But for them, it wasn't enough. They probably wanted uh, strikes against Kashmiri camps in Pakistan, or even an actual invasion. And I think it's been mentioned, although Kashmir would be the obvious place to go, because of the logistics and because of where it is, it's more likely the Punjab, if it was going to be an invasion. That would be the obvious thing for India. It would be an easier uh, uh, victory for them uh, than Kashmir, of course, in, in the high mountains. So that would be difficult. So, uh, very briefly, I have to say I'm an optimist, and I've mentioned this to Ranjit, I think generally the idea of a nuclear war, I think would be, wouldn't actually occur, but you could not rule it out. And even if there was no nuclear bombs used, uh, you know, a conventional war is still pretty bad, isn't it? And it's not something that we would lightly just write off. And of course in 1971, which is probably the, the largest invasion or the most recent one, there was no nuclear bombs in India or Pakistan as far as we know. So we don't know, there's no precedence of would it not escalate. And of course if India attacked in the, in the Punjab, as I said, could they do it to bring uh, it as a bargaining chip with Pakistan to say, well you leave Kashmir alone and we'll leave you alone and we'll retreat from Lahore or wherever they got as a bargaining tool. You can't rule that out. And of course, what would, could, could a, a Pakistani general, in, a, in an emotional response, fire off some missiles in order to, for their pride, that's possible? Um, I don't, I must admit, I'm unaware of the chain of command uh, of the Pakistani mu nuclear capability. Um, you know, could it be used without the Prime Minister's uh, acceptance? Would it need his precondition? I don't actually know that, maybe somebody does. But I have to say, I think, uh, I'm reasonably confident that Imran Khan wouldn't want to use a nuclear weapon because of his upbringing. I don't think he's totally involved in that emotional knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but again, we don't know, do we? Um, that's the optimist in me. But of course, all this is speculation. And the election of M Modi and more likely the re-election of Modi, the problem isn't actually Modi, in my opinion, it's the people behind him. The people who say, well, if you want to continue in power, you need to listen to us, you need to drive forward. Uh, but I don't think a nuclear uh, weapon will be used uh, other than by accident or by error or by emotion. I don't think it would be part of a strategy. It would be so, but if, if India did want to invade Pakistan to teach them a lesson, to try and use it as a bargaining chip, that's when uh, the generals might want to use a nuclear weapon uh, against the forces in order to even things up. It would be terrible, obviously, uh, uh, event and the implications and the escalations God only knows uh, but you could not rule it out so the best way of stopping that in the short term is international intervention I don't mean physical but diplomatic intervention our voices are, are won't be listened to although we try our best and Ranjit always does but generally we would need somebody of a higher diplomatic level in America or wherever to try and intervene and prevent and uh, uh, threaten, if you like, India, that we wouldn't accept that escalation. But in the long run, uh, you know, to, to stop this happening in the future, we need, the world needs to get to grips with what I call the need for a second decolonization. You know, unfinished business for when the empire, European empires uh, uh, collapsed uh, and were finished in a chaotic way, as people have said, but nevertheless, uh, we didn't have a proper decolonization because the, all the empires, we, the states or the provinces as they called it, were all artificial. They cut across borders, they cut across peoples. So clearly there needs to be another decolonization. And until that happens, we're going to keep revi revisiting and probably in this chamber over the next few years, took, talking about conflict which goes on time and time again. So Kashmir will never be solved. 
Khalistan and the Punjab will never be solved until there's a decolonization, or at least, as Franjit says, the opportunity for peoples around the world to choose their futures. And I feel sad that the fact that the Kashmiris and the Sikhs are not allowed that opportunity. So the Indians got their independence. I'm happy to, for that to have happened. But they didn't then extend that courtesy to other peoples that they held. And you're not the only one. And I know it's no real uh, comfort to say that. But there is about 100 different struggles going on around the world, in Africa and in Asia, and even the Catalans in, in Spain, who genuinely believe that the only way you can get genuine peace and, and justice is to have the right to self-determination, whether that's uh, assimilation, whether that's into, uh, um, uh, autonomy, or outright independence. And one day we need a visionary leaders like Dr. Chima actually running countries. Then we may see change. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Um, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. I, I think you, uh, you were one of those who needed to get away, so f if you need to. Yeah, but thank you for that. We really are under time pressure now. Um, usual story, at this time, uh, we start late and then we run out of time. So we're gonna, I'm going to call speakers now, but uh, with the qualification that I'm going to ask them all to be very, very brief. If that's okay, uh, no offense intended. Uh, I know people have prepared contributions, but I'm going to ask them to be really, really rapid uh, so that we can get through the list. Um, I'm going to ask um, our good friend Fahim Gyani, who is a Kashmiri leader and campaigner for Kashmiri self determination. Ajo Paji. Ajo. Ajo. So, um, nation's right. We support the Kashmiri uh, nation's right for self-determination. And if you can keep it really brief, Baji. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It's a great honor and privilege for me to speak this conference. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizer of this conference for organizing a successful conference. I'm going to be brief. Uh, we saw two months ago, how both countries, India and Pakistan, were on the brink of war. India, under the leadership of Narendra Modi, was about to, was about to cross the confrontational threshold which could trigger a nuclear war between two countries. If it happened, it wouldn't affect the South Asia region, it could bring devastating consequences for all over the world. I want to brief, I will cut short. In that situation, the Prime Minister of Pakistan responded sensibly to de-escalate the situation. And I will quote a few lines of his speech. With the weapon we have and the weapon you have, can we afford miscalculation? We shouldn't think that if this escalates, what will it lead to? But on the other hand, Narendra Modi carried the policy of appeasement in his election campaign and he threatened to wipe out Pakistan with the mother of bombs, and he further said, our nukes are not for Diwali. Nirindra Modi is a part of RSS, and RSS wrote in their literature in early, uh, in early 1930s, Kashmir, uh, Hitler is our ideal leader, second supreme leader of RSS, idealized Holocaust and thought it to be an effective way to deal with minorities. I had an article which was published uh, the last week about how India is dealing uh, with minorities and it was report, reported by U.S. 
Uh, I will cut short my speech because I had lots of things to say, but I want to keep you because you got long list. Uh, I agree with the statement of World Sikh Parliament. If war broke, broke out between two countries, the battlefield will be Punjab. As you know that Punjab is one of the highly populated areas in the subcontinent. I appreciate the statement given by World Sikh Parliament. We will not become, they said, they will not become a part of Modi's madness for the war and Sikh community will not participate uh, in the war if it happens between India and Pakistan. We do appreciate. At the end, I want to say about Kashmir, Narendra Modi has adopted the policies of Hitler and he put ban on civilian traffic to accommodate military movement in Indian occupied Kashmir for two, two days a week. Same like Hitler forbade Jews from using streets and pathways from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. in 1939. I want to give a message to the Indian government from this conference. We will resist your brutal policies on the ground and at all available forums at international level. As you know that Kashmir is the longest unresolved issue in the United Nations and the people of Kashmir are being punished by brutal Indian army for the crime of right of self-determination which was given by the UN. Thank you very much once again Rajin Singh for organizing such successful conference. I can see the lots of faces here. We always see uh, them in the protest even they are the minus temperature once again. Uh, Inshallah, we will coordinate uh, with the Sikh community because your targets, our target is same. We all of us, we are seeking for the right of self-determination, freedom for all, freedom for Kashmir. Thank you. Um, that was uh, Fahim Kiani of Tariqe Kashmir. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Gurnam Singh to speak. I'm going to be really... Um, Ruthless is the word, uh, and I'm going to cut people down literally to two or three minutes yeah. each, if possible. Thank you. Wahiguru Ji ka Khalsa, Wahiguru Ji ki Fateh. I will be very brief. Um, this conference is about peace, and nobody in the world can be against living a peaceful life. So the question is, what is the obstacle to coexistence and peaceful living? And the answer is simple, injustice. The denial of rights to ordinary people means that peace will never be possible without justice. So there are two sides of the same coin, and one cannot be realized without the other. But when we talk about justice, we are not simply talking about law. We are talking about social justice. We're talking about environmental justice and historical justice. And I'm pleased with the mission statement of the World Sikh Parliament which reflects this expansive conception of justice and peace uh, when it talks about social, religious, political, linguistic, human, and environmental rights. Now, though we have international structures such as the UN, the rights of ordinary people across the planet are still being blatantly denied. And tragically today, the world is being carved up by powerful hegemonic states such as China, US, uh, the EU, Russia, and India. And these nuclear superpowers do not function to serve the interests of the ordinary, peaceful, uh, peace-loving people in the world, but the interests of 5% of the population of the world, which owns 95% of the wealth. 5% owes 95%. And today, when ordinary people and communities, Punjabis and Kashmiris and others uh, of the world demand basic needs, health, education, clean water, safety, and the right to self-determination, they are labeled as terrorists and separatists just for demanding basic human rights. 
And it might be worth reminding ourselves that the majority of the countries of the world, including India and Pakistan, are less than 100 years old. The majority of the countries in the world are less than 100 years old. Uh, there is nothing natural about countries. It's the people that constitute nations. But today, people are denied their natural uh, indigenous rights to nationhood. So how can we achieve peace in the world? That's the key question. I'm going to just quote Martin Luther King. He said, peace cannot be kept by force. It cannot be achieved by, uh, without understanding. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. And in today's meeting, specifically focusing on Punjab and Kashmir, you know, we have been heard about John Speller and others and talk about the potentials for a nuclear catastrophe. But I would argue the fact that these two states are nuclear states actually makes uh, conventional warfare even more possible in Punjab because uh, both of them know that they will not drop bombs near their borders, nuclear bombs, but they will happily fight proxy wars as they have been doing since 47. Uh, so we demand uh, the rights of the planet, we demand rights of human beings. Um, uh, we need to think about uh, climate emergency because Punjab, the five rivers, uh, erosion of the rivers, er erosion of the coasts and the rising of sea levels themselves will be reasons for conflict, uh, dramatic climate change. Across the world, from Trump in the US to Bolsonaro in Brazil, from Putin in Russia to Erdogan in Turkey, from Modi in India to Jinping in China, we are seeing the emergence of a politics of authoritarianism and fascism, where minorities and progressive people are being threatened. But tragically, trade seeks to always take precedence over human rights. So to conclude, I would say just four things. I would say we need to work for peace and we need to work for love and we need to join together. We say no to hatred. We say no to the destruction of the planet and we say no to super states. We say yes to self-determination, yes to Halem Miraj, where people can live a peaceful coexistence. Let us create Begum Para, where social divisions are eradicated and fear and sorrow is banished. And let us establish Nanak Raj, the true fortress built on the strongest foundations of universal human rights and dignity. Thank you very much. Vaheguji ka khalsa, Vaheguji ki khalsa. Thanks very much uh, to Dr. Gurnam Singh. Um, I'm going to call um, Muzamil, Muzamil, am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, who is, who is a, a campaigner. Now, he's a director of the Justice Foundation and the Kashmir Institute for International Affairs. Um, he addresses the issue of uh, South Asia, Kashmir, and self-determination. And uh, we'd love him to say a few words very briefly, I'm afraid, by some. I'll keep the thank yous to the end, otherwise we'll go through them for a very long time. I had quite a lot of things that I could have said, but everything else before me has already been said. So I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Right of self-determination, we all want the same thing. We all want freedoms. We all want... Uh, um, the chance to live the way that we want to live. Now, peace, the way peace comes. Uh, without any justice, somebody mentioned that if you don't have justice, there is no peace. And peace, to bring peace, you also need the right to self-determination. What happens when love and lobbying and logic and intellect doesn't work? There are what the West or what India would call radicals that take up arms and ammunitions to address their qualms they, to address their problems and to address their fundamental requests. And what concerns me is something you mentioned, that you have so many people that are in Tehar jail. We have also in Kashmir, we have people that are suffering in Tehar jail in, in um, many other places. You know, Kashmir is considered to be the Guantanamo Bay of Asia. What worries me is when peace and logic and words don't work, and you lock up people just for thinking uh, or writing or speaking or going on the internet, eventually they become radicalized. I mean, I use this in inverted commas because it's, it's a natural progression. The, the, the United Nations gives you 
the opportunity to use force when your homeland is being occupied, when you're being subjugated, oppressed, killed, murdered on a regular basis. But the problem is international language. Now the reason I'm talking about armed conflict is because of language, of how we use different words. We recognize that Modi is a, a, a fantastic terrorist. You know, they, they, they consider Hitler, of all people, Hitler as their ideal. But let me tell you what the problem with Modi is. If Modi is in power or not, that should not worry you. Modi being in power is not a worry. The BJP is a problem. Because after Modi, if anybody is familiar with Indian politics, you know that you have Yogi Adityanath of UP, who said that you should take out the buried women and rape them. That's Yogi, this is the BJP second rung leadership. Who's the third rung leadership? Pragya Thakur, who unfortunately I, I share the same name with. Pragya Thakur, who is the Melagam uh, or one of the blast, uh, she was convicted and now she's running to become an MP. A con I mean, if anybody remembers, people used to laugh about Lalu Prasad Yadav. This guy is, a, is a not only unpardoned jahil, but he is also a convicted, most of the Indian politicians are convicted criminals. But now it's becoming, in those days, the media was not as present as it was today. Now such people are coming up into mainstream media, mainstream opposition, mainstream politics. And what I would want to say is in terms of, as, as conclusion, is that between the, uh, um, the Khalistan or the Punjab movement and the Kashmiri movement, unification on a common agenda, and that common agenda is always going to be the same thing, right to self-determination. But at the same time, it is the elimination of right-wing supremacy that is prevalent in India, which is suppressing the, uh, the movements of the minorities um, across you know, the, uh, the occupied territories of India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paisa. Um, I'm sorry to be ruthless with the timing, but we really are short, but I'm really grateful for your contribution. Um, and that, that was an interesting insight. So let me move on. Um, we have a, a speaker who is Jaspreet Singh, who is uh, a student. He does a lot of work, campaigning work, with the National Union of Students. Uh, so he's going to share us, share some views of his own. He's also going to read to the conference a message that we've had from the All India Sikh Student Federation, which has been one of the central uh, Pantak organizations for the Sikhs for many, many years. Why could you give it? Juru ji, man, thoda time lang ho bas. Pella gal hai, mare tha baba shukar hai ki aisi sare kathe baithe hain, aate aisi vicharan dey hain. Khas karke naujwan hai dilay, ek ek sabda knowledge hub ban janda ke saanu dekhan lap, disan lapan da ke haan bi itihas the bache chija honge aisi the future the bache ki ki ho sakda. To tanwaad aji sare hain da shukar why guru da baba. Sab to pehli gal aaj main ek ana chaunga ke zulm jodon da maraj ne sek pant chalaya ya. उस टाइम से तो अज टाइम से कोई डिफरेंस नहीं है कोई डिफरेंस नहीं है जो असं गुरबाणी पढ़ते हैं गुरबाणी के न जुड़ते हैं तो सूँ महाराज हमेशा आई हदायत देंगे कि खालसा हमेशा जुर्म के टाकरा करता है तो एक बड़ी वजी कहावत आ कहते हैं कि पाब के जमियां नित मुहिमा कि जेडे भी पंजाब जमते उन्होंने कुछ ना कुछ तो हों पर जी अजक मंदी शब्दावली मोदी वर्गे बंद ने वरती आ Uh, हमेशा हुकूमत जी हंकारी हुकूमत होंगी है वह कर दी इदा है भावें अजक राज लो या पहला राज ला लो जो बंद का हंकार सैर से टट जाता वो समझता मैं कुछ भी कर सकता है पर इस करके सू नौजवानों हंकारी हुकूमत भावें वह हिंदुस्तान की हुकूमत हो भावें कोई भी हुकूमत हो सू मैंटैलिटी समझ दी समझ की लड़ आ जोड़े हथियार हुकूमत ने पहल भी वरते वह अज भी वरतन रही है जिदा कह लो किसी को चक लेना घरों ला पता कर देना पहल भी सरकार कर दे रही अज दया भी कर दी हैं तो चंगे बदनाम करना बरतानवी सरकार ने जिदा महाराणी जिंद कौर में बदनाम किया खालसा राज के टाइम सिखा के सिर के मुल पाने मुगल राज के भी पै अज भी पै रहे हिंदुस्तान की सरकार पा रही है कि असं समझिए कि ये कि टूल बनाते हैं तो कितने कदों कदों वरतते हैं ये बहुत सूँ जरूरत है तो 
ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰੀ ਬੜੀ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿੰਗ ਗੱਲ ਦੋਕ ਦਿਨ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦਾ ਪਿਆ ਸੀਗਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਮੇਂ ਬਾਰੇ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨ ਡਏ ਸੀਗੇ ਤੇ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੁਰਸੇਖ ਹਨਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਕਾਲ ਅਕਾਲ ਚ ਬਲੀਵ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਮਸਕੀਨ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਤੁੱਕ ਯਾਦ ਆਈ ਮਸਕੀਨ ਜੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਤੀਤ ਨੂੰ ਇਤੀਦ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੋਇਆ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਜੋ ਕੁਝ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਸੋਚ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਪਛਤਾਵਾ ਕਰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਬਾਰੇ ਸੋਚ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਚਿੰਤਤ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਕਰਦਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਮਾਰਨ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟ ਆ ਆਪਾਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀ ਕਰੀਏ ਮਾਰੇ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਸ਼ੇਖ ਫਰੀਦ ਜੀ ਵੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆਜ ਮਲਾਮਾ ਸ਼ੇਖ ਫਰੀਦ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਮਾਫ ਕਰੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਅੱਗੇ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਦੀ ਤੁਕ ਭੁੱਲ ਗਈ ਕਿ ਅੱਜ ਹੀ ਆ ਸਾਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਚੈਲੰਜ ਕਰੀਏ ਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਗੁਰਸਿੱਖ ਨੈਰੇਟਿਵ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹ ਬਾਹਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਿਰਫ ਬੋਲਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਆ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਨੇ ਕਦੀ ਕਦੀ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝਦਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੇਰੇ ਵਰਗ ਨੂੰ ਅਕਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਕਦਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਬੋਲਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਦੀ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ 'ਚ ਇੰਨਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੋਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹ ਲੋ ਖੜੇ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਆਹੀ ਅਖੀਰ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਬਸ ਆਹੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਜੋ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਭਾਈਆਂ ਦਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੀ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਰਕੈਸਟ੍ਰੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਮਾੜਾ ਆ ਇਦਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਤੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਜਦੋਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਜ਼ਲੀਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਪਏ ਸੀਗੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਪਾਸੇ ਵੀਡੀਓਆਂ ਪਹੁੰਚਣ ਡਈਆਂ ਸੀ ਮੇਰੇ ਮਨ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਮੇਰਾ ਹਿਰਦਾ ਬਲੂੰਦਰਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਬੜਾ ਦੁੱਖ ਹੋਇਆ ਕਿ ਮੇਰੇ ਬਜ਼ੁਰਗ 84 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਇਹੀ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਨੇ ਇਦਾਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਹੋਰਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਇਦਾਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਬੜਾ ਦੁੱਖ ਹੋਇਆ ਤੇ ਅਖੀਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂ ਆਹੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਮਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਹਨਤ ਕਰਨੀ ਪੈਣੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਟੀਚੇ ਵੱਲ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਵਧਣਾ ਪੈਣਾ ਆ ਅਖੀ ਜੇ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਮਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਨਾਲ ਮਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਬਣਾਉਂਗੇ ਵੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੋਵਾਂ ਹੰਕਾਰੀ ਹਕੂਮਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਬਫਰ ਸਟੇਟ ਬਣੂਗੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੋਵਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਕਲ ਦਊਗੀ ਆਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੰਕਾਰ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਸਿਰ ਤੇ ਚੜਨ ਡਿਆ ਮਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਰਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਤਹਿਸ ਨਹਿਸ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਹੀ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਮਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਕਿਰਪਾ ਨਾਲ ਸੀ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਜੜਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹ ਲੋ ਜੜਾਂ ਚ ਰੱਖ ਕੇ ਉਹ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਨਿਮਾਣੇ ਨਿਤਾਣੇ ਨੀਵੀਆਂ ਜਾਤਾਂ ਵਾਲੇ ਜਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਨੂੰ ਅਨਸੇਫ ਫੀਲ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਭਾਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉੱਥੇ ਆ ਕੇ ਰਹੂਗਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਹਿਸਾਸ ਕਰਾ ਸੂਗੇ ਅਕਾਲ ਪੁਰਖ ਦਾ ਰਾਜ ਆ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਅਹਿਸਾਸ ਕਰਾ ਦਈਏ ਕਿ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਕਾਲ ਪੁਰਖ ਆਪ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਆ ਮੇਰੇ ਕੋ ਬਹੁਤ ਭੁੱਲਾ ਹੋ ਗਈਆਂ ਹੋਣਗੀਆਂ ਪਰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਖਿਮਾ ਕਰਨੀ ਜੀ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਔਨ ਸਟੇਟਮੈਂਟ ਪੜਨਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਜੀ ਜਗਰੂਪ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਆਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਿੱਖ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਫੈਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਅੱਜ ਜੋ ਸੱਦਾ ਕੱਲ ਲਿਆ ਆ ਪਿਆਰੇ ਕਾਨਫਰੈਂਸ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਟ ਹੋ ਆਪ ਜੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਜਾਣਦੇ ਹੀ ਹੋਵੋਗੇ ਕਿ ਆਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਿੱਖ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਫੈਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਬਟਵਾਰੇ ਤੋਂ ਕੁਝ ਕੁ ਸਾਲ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਹੋਂਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਈ ਸੀ ਅਤੇ ਇਸ ਤੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਮਤਿਆਂ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਬਟਵਾਰੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਆਜ਼ਾਦ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਾਜ ਲਈ ਇੱਕ ਖਾਸ ਮਤਾ ਪ੍ਰਵਾਨ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਆਪ ਜੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਹੀ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਜਾਣਦੇ ਹੋਵੋਗੇ ਕਿ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਕਾਇਦੇ ਆਜ਼ਮ ਮੁਹੰਮਦ ਅਲ
ਜੰਮੂ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਅਤੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਤਵੀ ਪੀੜਾਂ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਨਿਸ਼ਾਨਾ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਮੋਦੀ ਦੀ ਹੀ ਦੇਣ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਵਿਰੋਧ ਵੀ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੇ ਜ਼ਬਰਦਸਤ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਭੀੜ ਨੇ ਹੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਉੱਤੇ ਬਿਦਰਕਾਂਡ ਵਰਗੇ ਹਮਲੇ ਕਈ ਦਿਹਾਕੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਟਾਏ ਸੀ ਇਸ ਇਹ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਕਿ ਕੁਝ ਹੋਰ ਦਿਹਾਕਿਆਂ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਾਂ ਇਹ ਅਜਿਹੇ ਜ਼ੁਲਮਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਹਾਰ ਦੇ ਰਹੀਏ ਆਪਸੀ ਤਾਲਮੇਲ ਤੇ ਖੁਦ ਮੁਕਤਿਆਰੀ ਤੇ ਸੰਕਲਪ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਹੀ ਹਿੰਦੂਤਵੀ ਸਮਾਜ ਰਾਜ ਦਾ ਸਾਹਮਣਾ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਲਈ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਇਹ ਮਿਸਾਲ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਉਲੀਕਣ ਲਈ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਸਿੱਖ ਸੰਸਦ ਅਤੇ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਆਫ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਵਧਾਈ ਦੇ ਪਾਤਰ ਹਨ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਜਿੰਦਾਬਾਦ ਜਗਰੂਪ ਸਿੰਘ ਕਨਵੀਨਰ 올 ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਿੱਖ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਫੈਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦੀਆਂ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਇਹ ਸੱਦਾ ਕੱਲਿਆ ਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਸਮਝਣ ਟਾਈਮ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜੀਏ ਤੇ ਤਿਆਰ ਹੋਈਏ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਪੁਲਾ ਜੁਕਾ ਦੀ ਖੇਮਾ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ uh i'd like to ask um uh apne uh, simranji singh from aston university uh simranji singh has uh has done something unique aaj um so he and his colleagues have um set up what we believe to be the very first khalistan society at a university in the uk so it's a it's a new it's a new move it's a very welcome move it does apply and uh, i'm going to by sub ask you to be very very brief because of the shortage of time why guru ji ka call so why guru ji ki fateh really be definitely don't stick to that ਵਾਹੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਦਾ ਸਿਮਨਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਵਾਲੰਟੀਅਰ ਐਟ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਕਾਲਸਟਾਨ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਮੋਸਟ ਦੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਐਟ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਯੂਨੀ ਲੇਬਰ ਕਲੱਬ ਐਂਡ ਦਾ ਟ੍ਰੈਜਰਰ ਆਫ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਪਲਸਟਾਈਨ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਸੋ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਇਜ਼ ਕੁਆਇਟ ਫਾਰ ਫਰਮ ਵੇਅਰ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਸਿਟਿੰਗ ਰਾਈਟ ਨਾਓ ਬਟ ਨੇਵਰਲੈਸ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਲੁੱਕ ਐਟ ਦਾ ਜੂਇਸ਼ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਲੁੱਕ ਐਟ ਦਾ ਪੋਲਿਸ਼ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਆਲ ਵੈਰੀ ਇਨਟਾਈਡ ਟੂ ਦੇਅਰ ਹੋਮ ਲੈਂਡ ਟੂ ਦੇਅਰ ਰਿਸਪੈਕਟਿਵ ਹੋਮ ਲੈਂਡਸ ਐਂਡ ਦੇ ਕੀਪ ਟਰੈਕ ਔਨ ਵਾਟ ਇਜ਼ ਹੈਪਨਿੰਗ um back home if you look at alexander the great where he battled in punjab 2000 years ago as my colleague um by good breathing mentioned he mentioned the four battles in which um indo india and pakistan fought if we look at um 1971 the battle of lahore quite a famous battle was fought on the punjab frontier and um that same land where alexander the great fought similarly um indo and pakistan tanks also fought on that particular um frontier and a lot of bloodshed what was um was happened um uh, was caught um i mean 5 years later shadi ahmed said was attacked and the army siege occurred and the sikh nation is a major stakeholder in the uh, current peace um problems in in the region and no power should have the right to conduct war in the sikh homeland um as right of our self determination we should have um, a right to to speak out on problems occurring in the punjab and to um to to and that should be we should be able to protect our population and protect our territory the un should recognize the sikhs as a stakeholder and should engage in dialogue jani kartar singh passed a demand for a six state in 1944 and the shromni akali dal formalized the demand and passed the resolution for a six state later on Devinder Singh, Singh Devinder Singh Parmar arrived in London in, in 1954 and began to promulgate the view that Sikhs require an independent Sikh homeland Khalistan an independent Sikh state in Punjab acting as a buffer state is the only guarantee solution for peace in the subcontinent the Sikh and Kashmiri self determination struggles must be addressed as part of the conflict resolution so that we can truly bring peace to the subcontinent the late lieutenant general Jagjit Singh Arora in December 1990 was quoted as saying a fierce psychosis has gripped the state such a state like the present comes but rarely in human affairs however it's force compliant all and everyone let us challenge the darkness and collectively we will establish light vai gurji ka khalsa vai gurji ki fatah
Todd Salvai, good to give for Thank you, Bajit. Uh, sorry to push you on time, but we got the gist of that, and we're really, really impressed with the fact that you've set up this Khalistan Society. Um, maybe, hopefully, the first of many at a UK university. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Kalwan Singh Mutada, Sardar Kalwan Singh Mutada, to speak. He's a a uh, representative of one of the, the Panthak uh, Sikh parties. Muthada sahab, you have time to leave the party, you have to leave the party, you have to leave the party. This is Vaheguru Ji's name, sir. Vaheguru Ji's name. Vaheguru Ji's name. Vaheguru Ji's name. Sir, first of all, I was going to talk to you about the World Sikh Parliament, which has been kept in this conference. And where we have the same people, who 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 have the same people, सारे हाजर होए ने बीरो में एक आलेख नहीं चौना सारे यही बलारिया ने आप वो अपने विचार रखे जेड़ा आज रा साड़ा मेन जेड़ा साड़ा अजंडा जेड़ा हैगा आपने सेक्स कॉम दी आजादी रा जेड़ा साड़ा मसला जब मैं अपना देखते हैं जो आज हिंदुस्तान दे अंदर पात दे अंदर उस मोदी हकुमत बलों जो साड़े स जेडिया कोमा आपने आजादी दशिंग आचे लड़ रही हैं आपने कोम दे ले उन्हारे नाल मोटे नाल मोटा लाके अकठे होके ऐसी आपने आजादी दी लड़ाई ऐसी आपने कोमी गाल जेडी आज वर्ल्ड लेवल दे उत्तर जेडी पचाईये ताँ ऐसी जेड़ा ऑन वाले समय रे अंदर ओसा हिंदुस्तान दी देश बादी जेडी मोदी दी सरकार अगर फर्द जड़ी सरकार उसे मोदी भी बांट दिया किस तरह उसे जड़ा काट गया नहीं है तो जुलमटा आया जाऊँगा जड़ा आज भी टा आया जा रहा मैं सारे ही जड़े आज जितने सारे बीर पहुँचे ने उन्हें रातनवा आर कर दा सारे प्रबंध का रातनवा आर कर दा जिन्हें सानू टाइम देता सारे ऐसी कठे मठे हो के मोटे नल मोटा जोड़ के आपने कॉम दी आजादी ले खालस्तान दी आजादी ले जड़ा ऐसी आपने बाद जड़ के आपने बाद जड़ी बलंद करिए खालस्तान um, who has covered South Asia. Um, he's a photojournalist. He's also a director of something uh, which has become quite a, a popular website for those who follow, especially South Asia, WNTV. Uh, Imran Tahir, Irfan Tahir, I'd like you, Paisab, to be very, very brief and to address the event today. Thank you. نہستا میری خاموشی گفتگو ہے بے زبانی ہے زبا میری یہ دستور زبان بندی ہے کیسا تیری محفل میں یہاں تو بات کرنے کو ترستی ہے زبا میری سوت ایشیا کے حوالے سے جو جوہری توائنائی کے حوالے سے جو ٹاپک رکھا ہے رنجیت سنگھ سرائے صاحب نے میں ان کا بڑا شکر گزار ہوں سکھ ورڈ پارلیمنٹ کا بہت شکر گزار ہوں یہاں پر کشمیری جتنے بھی ہیں ان کے آپ نے احساسات و خیالات اور جذبات سنے ہیں جو نیوکلر اٹومک انرجی ہے سوت ایشیا کی جب ہم بات کرتے ہیں سوت ایشیا کے اندر آٹھ کنٹریز جو ہیں انوالو ہیں جو کسی نہ کسی طرح وہاں پہ افیکٹ ہو رہے ہیں اس نیوکلر پاور کی وجہ سے دونوں یعنی دو قوتیں وہاں پر موجود ہیں لیکن اگر ہم نائنٹی فورٹی سیون میں دیکھیں پہلی جنگ ہوتی ہے کشمیر کے اوپر دوسری جنگ نائنٹی سکسٹی فائف کے اندر جو ہے وہ بھی کشمیر پہ ہوتی ہے نائنٹی سیونٹی ون کے اندر جو آپ نے ذکر کیا وہ جنگ بھی جو ہے کشمیر پہ ہوتی ہے پھر نائنٹی نائن کی جو ہے ایک مائنر سی جنگ ہوئی لیکن کارگل کا واقعہ وہ بھی بہت بڑا سانحہ تھا میں یہ بتانا چاہوں گا کہ دنیا کے اندر جو ہے گلوبل فائر ایک ویب سائیڈ ہے جہاں پر ٹیکنالوجی کے حوالے سے انہوں نے کچھ فیکٹس اینڈ فیگر دیئے ہیں کہ چائنا اور امریکہ دس طرح انٹرنیشنل ورلڈ کے اندر جو ہے ایک دوسرے کو مات دینے کے لیے ٹیکنالوجی کے اعتبار سے معاشی جو جنگ ہے وہ جاری و ساری ہے اسی طرح ساؤت ایشیا کے اندر پاکستان اور انڈیا کی جو تصادم ہے وہ بڑھتا جا رہا ہے یہاں میں تھوڑا سا جو ہے ان کا کمپیریزن جو ہے شارٹ کیونکہ ٹائم ہے میں پیش کرنا چاہوں گا کہ اس گلوبل فائر ویب سائیڈ نے جو ہے انڈیا کو وہاں پر چوتھے نمبر پہ منشن کیا ہے جو طاقتور فوج رکھتی ہے اور اس کے اندر انہوں نے سنت کی بھی جو ہے وہ پیمانہ رکھا ہے 
کارکردگی کے حوالے سے یعنی پہلی دوسری اور تیسری دنیا کے ساتھ ان کے تعلقات کیسے ہیں ان کو مد نظر رکھتا رکھا ہے نو لاکھ انیس ہزار پاکستان کی ٹوٹل فوج ہے بتالیس لاکھ جو ہے انڈین فوج ہے اس کے علاوہ بکتر بند گاڑیوں کی بات کریں توپوں کی بات کریں ٹیمپوں کی بات کریں فضائیہ کی بات کریں تو انڈیا ہر اعتبار سے جو ہے پاکستان سے بہت آگے ہے ان ہتھیاروں کی اگر بات کریں ٹیکنالوجی کی بات کریں بحری بیرا جو ہے ہتھیاروں کے حوالے سے انڈیا کے پاس موجود ہے پاکستان کے پاس موجود نہیں ہے لیکن یہ واحد جہاں آپ نگیٹیوٹی دیکھتے ہیں جوہری توانائی کے حوالے سے اٹامک پاور کے حوالے سے وہاں پہ ایک پازیٹیو یہ ہے کہ دونوں ملکوں کے پاس یہ ٹیکنالوجی ہونے کے باعث انڈیا تمام تر یعنی پاور ہونے کے بعد ون پوائنٹ یعنی جو ہے ٹو ارب جو ہے یہ اس کی نیشن ہے بیس کروڑ لوگوں سے جو ہے وہ پھر بھی تھریٹن ہے اس وجہ سے کہ ان کے پاس ٹیکنالوجی موجود ہے ایٹم موجود ہے وہ ڈرتے ہوئے جو ہے جنگ نہیں کرتا لیکن اس کے اثرات جو ہے پوری دنیا کے اندر پھیل رہے ہیں انہی ریجن کی وجہ سے سری لنکا کے اندر کیا ہوا مالدیپ کے اندر کیا سچویشن ہے نیپال کے کیا صورت حال ہے بنگلہ دیش کا کیا سنیریو ہے وہاں پر انتہا پسندی اور دہشت گردی کے جو باعث ہیں یہ چیزیں ہیں لیکن اس کے لیے ایک ہی سلوشن جو ہے وہ پوری دنیا کو ورلڈ لیول پہ یونائٹڈ نیشن ہیومن رائٹس کونسل کی ہم بات کریں یورپین یونین کی بات کریں جنرل اسمبلی جو ہے یونائٹڈ نیشن کی امریکہ کی بات کریں تو وہاں پہ بھی یہی سنیریو جو ہے ڈسکس ہو رہے ہیں کہ دنیا کے اندر جو ہے سب سے اگر خطرناک کوئی جنگ چھیڑ سکتی ہے اور یہ کلنٹن نے جو ہے لاسٹ ٹائم بھی جو ہے اپنے دور کے اندر کہا تھا کہ کشمیر موسٹ ڈینجرس جو ہے یہ پلیس ہے دنیا کے اندر جہاں پر ابھی تک راؤنڈ اباؤٹ جو ہے ایک لاکھ لوگ جو ہے شہادتیں اور قربانیاں پیش کر رہے کر چکے ہیں میرے جتنے بھی یعنی پیش رو مقرر تھے انہوں نے بتایا کہ پلوامہ کے بعد کیا سنیریو ہوا پھر فضائی حدود کے حوالے سے ایک دوسرے پہ تنقید ہوئی یہ سارا سنیریو اسی وقت جو ہے سارٹ آؤٹ ہوگا جب کشمیریوں کو سیلف ڈٹرمنیشن دیا جائے گا جیسے نارتھ کوریا کے حوالے سے آپ بات کرتے ہیں کہ جناب اسے ایٹم ٹیکنالوجی نہیں ملنی چاہیے ایران کی نہیں ملنی چاہیے اسی طرح آپ کو جو ہے اسرائیل جو ہے سب سے بڑا سپلائر ہے انڈیا کو جو ایٹم جو ہے ایٹمی قوت یا مزائل جو ہے وہ پرووائڈ کر رہا ہے ابھی ریسنٹلی اگر آپ اسٹڈی کریں تو ستر ملین ڈالر کا ان کا جو ہے آپس میں ایک معاہدہ ہوا ہے جس کے ذریعے سے وہ زمین سے جو ہے وہ فضا میں مار کرنے والے مزائل جو ہے اسرائیل سے خرید رہا ہے اور سب سے بڑا سپلائر جو ہے اسلے اسلے کا وہ اسرائیل ہے تو آپ کو ایک انصاف جو ہے برتنا ہوگا ہم کسی ملک پہ تنقید نہیں کرتے دنیا کے اندر جتنی بھی جو ہے بڑی طاقتیں ہیں برطانیہ ہے امریکہ ہے روس ہے جرمنی ہے فرانس ہے ان تمام لوگوں کو جو ہے یہ سلوشن جو ہے اس کی طرف جانا ہوگا میں اپنا اسی جو ہے اپنی بات ختم کروں گا کیونکہ زیادہ وقت نہیں ہے ان اشعار کے ساتھ اقبال کے کہ اللہ سے کرے دور تو تعلیم بھی فتنا اللہ سے کرے دور تو تعلیم بھی فتنہ املاک بھی اولاد بھی جاگیر بھی فتنہ نہ حق کے لیے اٹھے تو شمشیر بھی فتنہ شمشیر ہی کیا نعرہ تکبیر بھی فتنہ جزاک اللہ تھینک یو Um, leading the campaign for a, a non-binding, non-governmental referendum of the Sikhs of Punjab for independence. Um, the Indian government has responded, as always, by oppressing those who are campaigning for that referendum. We condemn the Indian government action for targeting people who are seeking to articulate what we've been talking about today in a non-violent, peaceful manner. Why should somebody target those people? Why should they criminalize those people? That is exactly what's happening. Um, so Six for Justice is, is raising awareness of the, of the Khalistan and the sex self-determination agenda and it has become quite a powerful force in uh, sex circles and beyond. So, Pai Sahib, you have two minutes, please. Six for Justice, you have to give your answer. First of all, I have to give you all the answers. I have to give you all the answers. 
ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਔਰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇੱਥੇ ਸਮਾਂ ਦੇਣ ਲਈ ਵੀ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਤਕਰੀਬਨ ਮੈਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਡੀਟੇਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਣਾ ਆਪਾਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਡਿਸਕਸ਼ਨ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੇਨ ਅੱਜ ਦਾ ਫੋਕਲ ਪੁਆਇੰਟ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਇਹ ਰਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਆ ਔਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲਾਅ ਆ ਉਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਜਾਜ਼ਤ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਆ ਆਪਣਾ ਇਹ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਇਹ ਹੱਕ ਐਕਸਰਸਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਤਕਰੀਬਨ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀਆਂ ਜਿੰਨੀਆਂ ਵੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮਸ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਡਿਸਕਸ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਸੋ ਜੋ ਉੱਥੇ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਆ ਮੈਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਪਰ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੇਖਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਜੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਰਾਈਟ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਦੇ ਰਿਹਾ ਆ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹ ਹਾਸਲ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਰਨਾ ਪੁਆਇੰਟ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਸਾਡੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਆ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਆ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਕੀ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਪਤਾ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲਾਅ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਜਾਜ਼ਤ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਜ ਭਾਗ ਸਾਡੀ ਕੌਮ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਕਾਬਲ ਆ ਔਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੀਆਂ ਜਿੰਨੀਆਂ ਵੀ ਧਰਾਵਾਂ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਖਰੇ ਉਤਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਜ ਰੀਐਸਟੈਬਲਿਸ਼ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਔਰ ਉਹ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਸਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਖੜਾ ਆ ਪਰ ਦੇਖਣ ਵਾਲੀ ਹੁਣ ਗੱਲ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਆ ਉਹ ਐਕਸਰਸਾਈਜ਼ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਰਨਾ ਇੱਥੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਵੀ ਆਏ ਸੀ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਇੱਥੇ ਦੀ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ 12 ਤਰੀਕ ਨੂੰ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਸਾਲ ਦੀ ਅਗਸਤ ਦੀ ਲੰਡਨ ਡੈਕਲਾਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ 2020 ਦੀ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਉਹਦੀ ਤਿੰਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨੇ ਡੀਮਾਰਸ਼ੇ ਜਾਰੀ ਕੀਤੇ ਸੀ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਰੋਕਣ ਲਈ ਉਸ ਦੇ ਬਾਵਜੂਦ ਵੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੱਕ ਆ ਆਪਣੀ ਫ੍ਰੀਡਮ ਆਫ ਸਪੀਚ ਦਾ ਉਹ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਆ ਪਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਜ ਭਾਗ ਆਪਣਾ ਦੇਸ਼ ਬਣਾਉਣਾ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਆ ਗੱਲ ਇਹ ਆ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਅੰਤਰਰਾਸ਼ਟਰੀ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਆ ਰੀ ਡੀਟੇਲ ਆ ਪੂਰੀ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਹੱਕ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਸਹਾਈ ਹੋ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਇਹ ਡੀਟੇਲ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਚਿਰ ਟੇਬਲ ਤੇ ਰਹੂਗੀ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਚਿਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਿਰਫ ਇੱਕ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੂੰ ਡਿਸਕਸ਼ਨ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਇਹ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਰਨਾ ਗੱਲ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਮੁਲਕ ਨੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਰਾਬਤਾ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਪੱਤਰ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਐਕਸਰਸਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਹੱਕ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਔਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਦਬਾਅ ਬਣਾਓ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਕਿ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਵੇ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੀ ਸੁਪਰਵੀਜ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਰੋਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਅਗਰ ਉਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਵਾਉਂਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੋਲ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਆਪਣਾ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕਤਲੋਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਕੁਰਦਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਔਰ ਇੱਕ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਰ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਸਪਸ਼ਟ ਕਰਨੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਆ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਪਾਜੀ ਕੋਈ ਸਰਵੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਓਪੀਨੀਅਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਓਪੀਨੀਅਨ ਤਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲਾਅ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਨੂੰ ਰੈਕੋਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਦਾ ਸੋ ਜੇ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੁਸੀਂ
ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪੂਰਾ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਉਣ ਦਾ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਵਸਦਾ ਹੈ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲੀ ਡਿਜੀਟਲ ਪੀਪਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਇੰਡੀਜੀਨਸ ਪੀਪਲ ਵੋਟ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਕਿ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੱਲਾ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਨਹੀਂ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਸਟੇਟ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਹੋ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਯੂਐਨ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਰੈਕੋਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਜਾਈਏ ਜਾਂ ਜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਹਥੈਸ਼ੀ ਨੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਹੋਵੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਉਹ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਨ ਹੋਵੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦਾ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦਾ ਔਰ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਹਥੈਸ਼ੀਆਂ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਨੂੰ ਯੂਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਰੈਜ਼ੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਮੁਲਕ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਾਏ ਰੱਖਣ ਦਾ ਅਧਿਕਾਰ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਜਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਹੋਰ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਘੱਟ ਗਿਣਦੀਆਂ ਦੀ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਦਬਾਉਂਦਾ ਆ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਹੱਕ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਕਿਸ ਦੀ ਕਿਸੇ ਦੀ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਦਬਾਏ ਔਰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਚੋਣ ਰਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਉਹ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਨਾਲ ਰਹਿਣਾ ਪਸੰਦ ਕਰਨ ਜਾਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਸੋ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਡਿਸਕਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੁੱਦਾ ਆ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਥੈਟਸ ਫਾਈਨ ਉਹ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਬਣੇ ਨੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਉਹਦੇ ਬੜੇ ਬੜੇ ਕਿਤਾਬ ਚ ਵੀ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਕੀ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੇ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਉਹ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਕਰਨਾ ਗੱਲ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕੋ ਇੱਕ ਜ਼ਰੀਆ ਆ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਡੈਮੋਕ੍ਰੈਟਿਕ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਹੈ ਡੈਮੋਕ੍ਰੈਟਿਕ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਿਰਫ ਇੱਕ ਹੀ ਤਰੀਕਾ ਕਾਰਗਰ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹੈ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਉਹ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ 2020 ਹੋਏ ਜਾਂ ਉਹ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਤਲੋਨੀਆ ਸਪੇਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਏ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਰਦਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਏ ਕਰਦਿਸਤਾਨ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਡੀ ਐਗਜ਼ਾਮਪਲ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲੇਗੀ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਕੋਲ ਟੈਂਕ ਸੀ ਤੋਪਾਂ ਸੀ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਕੋਲ ਆਪਣੀ ਆਰਮੀ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਦਾ ਸਹਾਰਾ ਲੈਣਾ ਪਿਆ ਆਪਣੀ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਹੁੰਚਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਭਾਜੀ ਹੁਣਾਂ ਨੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਵੀ ਮੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੌਰੀ ਮੈਂ 1 ਮਿੰਟ ਹੋਰ ਲਵਾਂਗਾ ਭਾਜੀ ਹੁਣਾਂ ਨੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਵੀ ਮੈਂਸ਼ਨ ਕੀਤਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗਏ ਉੱਥੇ ਤਾਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਪਤਾ ਹੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਧੱਕਾ ਹੋਇਆ ਤੇ ਫਿਰ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਪਤਾ ਹੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਧੱਕਾ ਹੋਇਆ ਫਿਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਟੇਬਲ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਆਪਣੀ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮਸ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਰੱਖਾਂਗੇ ਸਿਰਫ ਇੱਕੋ ਇੱਕ ਤਰੀਕਾ ਹੈ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਆਪਣੀ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਇਕੱਠੀ ਕਰੋ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ 2020 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਉਸ ਦਾ ਕਲੇਮ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਏ ਐਟ ਲੀਸਟ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਟੇਬਲ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ ਕਲੀਅਰ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਕਿ ਯੈਸ देयर इज अ ਡਿਸਪਿਊਟ ਇਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨਾਟ ਓਨਲੀ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਖਾਲਿਸਤਾਨ ਵੀ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀ ਵੀ ਡਿਸਪਿਊਟ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਉਹ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੀ ਸੁਪਰਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਥੇ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਇਆ ਜਾਏ ਔਰ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਕਿਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਰਹਿਣਾ ਆ ਆਪਣੀ ਕਿਸਮਤ ਦਾ ਫੈਸਲਾ ਇਹ ਲੋਕ ਕਰਨ ਸੋ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਪੀਲ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਇੱਥੇ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ ਤਕਰੀਬਨ ਹੁਣ ਤਾਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਚਲੇ ਗਏ ਨੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਭਾਜੀ ਹੁਣੀ
ਸੈਕੰਡ ਵਰਲਡ ਵਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਕੰਟਰੀਆਂ ਲਈ ਸ਼ਹਾਦਤਾਂ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਫੌਜੀ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਯੂਰਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਫਰਜ਼ ਬਣਦਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੀ ਕੌਮ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹ ਦਰਦਨਾਕ ਇਹ ਕਹਾਣੀ ਆ ਜੋ ਜੋ ਸਾਡਾ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਆ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਤੇ ਜੋ ਸਾਡਾ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਰਾਜ ਸੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਾਜ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਕਾਇਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਯੂਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੈਜ਼ੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਪਾਉਣ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਇਹੀ ਸਮਝਾਂਗਾ ਕਿ ਇਹੀ ਇੱਕ ਸੁਹਿਰਦ ਹਮਦਰਦੀ ਹੋਏਗੀ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਜਾਂ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀਆਂ ਨਾਲ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਕੱਲੀ ਵਾਇਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਾ ਕਰੋ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਾ ਕਰੋ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰੋ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਭਾਈ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਰੂਰ ਬਾਕੀ ਜੋ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਟ ਕੁਛ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਟ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਸਮਾਂ ਕਰਕੇ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਕੁਛ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਟ ਚਲੇ ਗਏ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਬਿਆਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਕੋਲ ਸਾਂਝੇ ਜਰੂਰ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਹੁਣ ਮੈਂ ਸਰਦਾਰ ਅਮਰੀਕ ਸਿੰਘ ਸੋਤਾ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਜੋ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਆਫ ਖਾਲਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਕਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਕੁਛ ਸਿਰਫ 2 ਮਿੰਟਾਂ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸੋਤਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਸੰਗਤ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਟਾਈਮ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕਾ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਆਏ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਸੋਹਣੇ ਤੇ ਸੱਚੇ ਢੰਗ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਆ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਸਿਰਫ 1-2 ਮਿੰਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੋ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਕਲੀਅਰ ਕਰਨੀਆਂ ਚਾਹੁੰਨਾ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਨੇ 1984 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ 86 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਰਵਤ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਬੁਲਾਇਆ ਗਿਆ 29 ਅਪ੍ਰੈਲ ਨੂੰ ਡਿਕਲੇਅਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਆਪਣਾ ਘਰ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਬਫਰ ਸਟੇਟ ਬਿਟਵੀਨ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਤੇ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਵੱਡੀ ਸੇਫਟੀ ਮਿਲਦੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਲੜਾਈ ਨਾ ਹੋ ਸਕੇ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਲੈਣ ਦਾ ਤਰੀਕਾ ਕੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਇਹ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠੇ ਆ 7-8 ਮਿਲੀਅਨ ਸਿੱਖ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅੱਜ ਸਾਡੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠੇ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅੱਜ ਕੰਪਿਊਟਰ ਸਾਇੰਟਿਸਟ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਗੁੱਡ ਕੁਆਲਿਟੀ ਡਿਸੀਜਨ ਮੇਕਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਾਵਾਂਗੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਇਹ ਇਹ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਰੱਖਾਂਗੇ ਤਦੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਗੱਲ ਤੇ ਕਾਮਯਾਬ ਹੋਵਾਂਗੇ ਇੱਕ ਗੱਲ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਆਪਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਯਾਦ ਰੱਖਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿੰਨਾ ਚਿਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਥੇਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਵੀ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਡਿਸੀਜਨ ਮੇਕਿੰਗ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਆ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਵੇ ਚਾਹੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਇੰਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਉਹ ਬਣਾਈ ਜਾਵੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖ ਐਸ ਵਿਲ ਸ਼ਾਏ ਆ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਡੇ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਭਰਾ ਵੀ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਤੇ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਚਾਹਵੇ ਕਿ ਲੜਾਈ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਹਰੇਕ ਬੰਦਾ ਇਹ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਪੀਸਫੁਲੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਹੱਕ ਆ ਉਹ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਦੇਖੋ 1947 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਏ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਡਾ ਹੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੋ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਤੋਂ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਕਹਿਣੀ ਦੱਸਣੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਹੱਕ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਭੀਖ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਹੱਕ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ
Okay. So Manpreet Singh is going to say a few words, uh, and then I'm going to present the uh, the draft resolutions. And uh, at that point, assuming we can uh, agree upon those, we should be able to close the conference. Manpreet Singh. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fateh. I mean, this just reminds us on that day when we actually received a letter from Jathedar Jagdar Singh Hawara, where he said that in 2015 there was a resolution passed in Sarbat Khalsa to create the World Sikh Parliament. And seven and eight of us decided to work to how to implement this and have a platform like this for every organization who's working for the freedom of our Sikh nation has actually got a platform where they can raise their voice to the international community. I would like to thank you all today on behalf of each and every member, the 150 members at the minute for the World Sikh Parliament and the other associate members of World Sikh Parliament who's actually made this day a reality. All of you are present here in spirit or in person. You guys have actually proven one solid point here today. How important is peace to human civilization? All of you who were here, we all know what's happening in Southeast Asia. We all know how this so-called largest democracy in the world has actually put hundreds and thousands of innocent people under the threat of a war which is expectedly going to be the most destructive war human race has ever seen. To fulfill their fascist Hindu agenda, that's their only goal. And obviously we as a Sikh nation, we all know, and I'm not going to repeat so many of the points we have already witnessed, enough damage, enough persecution, enough loss of our loved ones, whether it be 1947 or 1984 or the early, early 90s. Where this so-called secular democracy actually showed its true color and murdered hundreds and thousands of the Sikh in broad daylight. Our geographical nation, which is East Punjab, that should have been an independent state, ideally, and will, will it, it will be, God willing, is under Indian occupation at the minute. We all understand that this war will pose a total destruction of our Sikh homeland. Now, obviously, not to forget, we have 100 plus holy shrines and historical significant places which are specially related to our Sikh Raj in the other, pa in, in the other Punjab, which is West Punjab in the Pakistan. So any of these places, they get decimated, we will incur heavy loss. Any war that is forced upon our homeland could completely destroy our heritage and majority of our population which is remaining. I urge all of you who are here today to unanimously pass this resolution that our community who has been a successful nation in the past and aspires to be a nation in the future should be kept out of this war at any cost. Also taking another step in the direction of peace. I would request you all to make sure that we abide by this resolution that all the indigenous people of Punjab and Kashmir, which is occupied by India, should actually be given the right opportunity to exercise their right of self-determination under 1966 covenants of the United Nations. This is our basic human right. This will obviously pave a way for the creation of the buffer state, which will actually then resolve these issues forever. Just to sum up on this, we need to recognize one thing which people sometimes don't. We need to recognize that India is never going to accept and has already raised their reservations for this international covenants, if I'm not wrong. 
they do not agree to this right of self determination covenant and you know mahatma gandhi has been quoted by one of our speaker today i would like you all to know what was his views about self determination this is very important this is his words i'm not just making this up if every component part of the nation claims the right of self determination for itself there is no one nation there is no independence this is what he thinks about actually indigenous people who are trying to create their own nation already declining so the right of the indigenous people this explains why india has reservations against this article now we all know in siz ganj gurdwara before the independence in 1935 gandhi actually promised in his own words that you will actually get a state which you will control and you can actually enjoy the 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 beauty of the independence this this is what he promised but never delivered so to some some of this conference i i would definitely like to say who all we are here you know we are the ones who care for the peace we have to work together we got no choice in solidarity to achieve what we deserve is to live free in peace at last i would like to quote one of my favorite authors his name is ralph waldo the only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be this is what we need to decide so let's all decide we need to live free live in peace and have a nation thank you why guruji ka khalsa why guruji um manpreet singh by the way um is is the engine um behind uh, the world sec parliament and uh, a bright star for the future so um thank you for everything that you've done to pull the event together um and for those views on the issue at hand i'm going to wrap up now with some draft resolutions i should say because of the shortage of time i haven't been able to share some excellent written contributions that we've had from people who couldn't make it salma yakub who is a patron of the stop the war coalition uh raina nazir founder of the british kashmiri women council robin marsh who is the secretary general of the united peace federation kaleem hussain who is a peace activist a lot of people have contributed to this event and we haven't been able to read i've got all their written statements here and i'm happy to share them with anybody who cared to look at them um so the draft resolutions we've had which we've circulated amongst a few of us are as follows four of them number 1 this conference calls on the international community led by the united nations to tackle the warmongering voices that are promoting a war between nuclear armed india and pakistan so that it is made clear that war is not an option to resolve the disputes between those states such a war risks catastrophic destruction in south asia with potentially tens of millions of lives being lost in the region even in a limited nuclear exchange use of nuclear weapons that can annihilate civil civilian populations constitutes a crime against international law and those in power must be made aware that they will be held accountable for any such atrocity in south asia secondly this conference notes that the sikh nation's homeland in punjab would be the likely theater of war and that it is not a party to the indo pakistan dispute it is a key stakeholder in peace in the region its population and homeland must not be targeted or used to perpetrate a war which would be completely destructive to the sikh national interest the sikhs must be consulted by all parties to the dispute so as to ensure that damage to the sikh populations and holy sites in punjab whether in east or west punjab is averted number 3 this conference calls or urges india 
Pakistan and China, as well as the United Nations, to urgently engage with all stakeholders in the disputes that affect the territories along the border between India and Pakistan, to help resolve conflicts peaceably and in accordance with international law. The aspirations of the peoples of Kashmir and Indian-controlled Punjab, where there are ongoing legitimate self-determination struggles, underpinned by Article 1 of the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, must be respected if there is to be enduring peace in the region. Fourthly and lastly, this conference requests the UK government as a permanent member to raise the issues highlighted at this conference in the United Nations Security Council as an urgent priority. It owes a duty to the hundreds of thousands of diaspora Sikhs and Kashmiris living in the UK, all of whom have deep connections with their respective homelands, to prevent war and to seek peaceable, peaceable conflict resolution in South Asia. As the former colonial power whose chaotic departure resulted in the intractable conflicts still simmering, it also has the moral responsibility to intervene. So those comments there. So, Bole So Nehal. Um, we will share these resolutions, not only amongst our own communities, we're going to share these resolutions with the states that surround Kashmir and Punjab. We're going to tell them that they have a responsibility to listen to the authentic indigenous people's viewpoint, because they are the stakeholders who, whose views are going to lead to ultimate solution of those conflicts. We'll share it with the United Nations, we'll share it with the media, and thank you to the media organizations uh, who have been here today, from uh, the Sikh media, from the Kashmiri media. Uh, we're really grateful for your contribution. Joga um, Singh would you like to say a few words to, to wrap up? Ajahn. Ajahn. Go. Jika Khalsa, Waheguru Ji Ki Fateh, Sare Anda is conference de vich shamil hon lehi. Asi Sare Pravanda Gaab Ji da Teh Dilotan Vaad kar de haan. और आप जी ਦੇ ਚਾਰਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਮਸਲਿਆਂ ਤੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰੈਕਟਿਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਲਿਆਉਣਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਾਂ ਹੱਲ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪੜ੍ਹੇ ਲਿਖੇ ਹੋ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਬੋਲ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਲਿਖ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਹਰ ਮੁਲਕ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਣਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਆ ਪਹੁੰਚਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਹਰ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਬੈਸੀ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਣੀ ਗੱਲ ਪਹੁੰਚਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕੌਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਪੰਜ ਮੁਲਕ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਵੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਸਲੇ ਦਾ ਹੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਘੱਟੋ ਘੱਟ ਆਪਣਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਪਲੇਟਫਾਰਮ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਹਾਈਲਾਈਟ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਗਾਂ ਹਰ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਣੀ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਆਪਾਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਰਲ ਮਿਲ ਕੇ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕੋਈ ਇੱਕ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਦੇ ਵਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਤੇ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਾਫੀ ਚਰਦੇ ਆਏ ਆ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਦੁਜਿਆ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀਆਂ ਜੋ ਕ੍ਰਿਸਚੀਅਨ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਮੁਸਲਮ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਆਏ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲ ਤੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਵੀ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਆਪਣਾ ਕੋਈ ਸੁਝਾਅ ਹੋਵੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸੋ ਆਪਾਂ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਗਾਂ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਇੰਪਰੂਵ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਗਾਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਆ ਭਾਈ ਦੂਜੀ ਚੜ੍ਹਦੀ ਕਲਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰੀਏ ਸੋ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਭਾਈ ਰਣਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਭਾਈ ਮਨਪ੍ਰੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਬੇਨਤ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੂੰ ਲਿਖਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਬਸ ਅਜ ਗੈਸਟ ਪੇਰੈਂਸ ਹੀ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਬਹਿ ਗਿਆ ਬਾਕੀ ਕੰਮ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੋਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਦਾਸ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲ ਤੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਾਬਾਦ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਾਬਾਦ ਭਾਈ ਭਾਈ ਰਣਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਦਾ ਸੁਝਾਇਆ ਆਪਣੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਗਿਣਤੀ ਮੈਂਬਰ ਤੇ ਚਲ ਗਿਆ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਇੱਕ ਘ
ਜਿੰਨੇ ਜਣੇ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਫੋਟੋ ਬਣਾ ਲਈਏ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਫੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਯਾਦਗਾਰ ਰਹਿ ਜਾਗੇ ਵੀ ਆਓ ਸਾਰੇ ਜਣੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਮੋਰੇ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਮੋਰੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਜੀ ਉੱਪਰੇ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਜੀ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਠੀਕ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਜੀ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਆ ਜਾਓ ਜੀ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਫੋਟੋ ਖਿੱਚ ਲਈਏ ਜੀ so the world set parliament has become in effect the representative body apne ilake de pindan shaharan ate nagaran de vich niji dharmik samajik rajnitik ate khedan de har prakar de program puri duniya de vich prasarit karan vaste hd quality de naal aap ji di seva de vich hazir hai awazecom tv ajj hi sampark karo awazecom tv ਆਪਣੇ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਦੇ ਪਿੰਡਾਂ ਸ਼ਹਿਰਾਂ ਅਤੇ ਨਗਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਿੱਜੀ ਧਾਰਮਿਕ ਸਮਾਜਿਕ ਰਾਜਨੀਤਿਕ ਅਤੇ ਖੇਡਾਂ ਦੇ ਹਰ ਪ੍ਰਕਾਰ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਪੂਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪ੍ਰਸਾਰਿਤ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਐਚ ਡੀ ਕੁਆਲਿਟੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆਪ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹੈ ਆਵਾਜ਼ੇਕਮ ਟੀਵੀ ਅੱਜ ਹੀ ਸੰਪਰਕ ਕਰੋ ਆਵਾਜ਼ੇਕਮ ਟੀਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਦ